Good evening. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, July 14th, 2020. As we begin, I want to welcome our new student member of the board, Joshua Muhamza. Every July, when our former student member of the board graduates, the board welcomes a new SMOB. Mr. Muhamza is a rising senior from Dundalk High School. He was elected in the early spring by a student election that included the opportunity for all middle and high school students to participate. We're grateful for his passion and sense of purpose, and he has already hit the ground running by participating in the BCPS race and racism conversation that was held on July 8th. And that uh, video is available on bcps.org. And to start the meeting, I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag led by Mr. Muhamza. We will then have a moment of silence to remember those that have served Baltimore County Public Schools. Mr. Mahumsa. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which, it, for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member to participate fully and allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meetings that are open pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by a roll call vote and board members will say their names before making and seconding the motion as needed, as well as when discussing an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the agenda. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, are there any so, additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I think there may be one addition. Let me just pause for the board member. Madam Chair, I make a motion to amend the agenda to add an item to change the title of the board equity resolution. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Mr. Mahumza, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, um, I believe on June, uh, the last board, one of the last two board meetings in June, the, my predecessor passed a resolution specific to the ongoing civil rights movement for the Black Lives Matter. And um, I know there was some miscommunications in terms of the title, and I just want to clarify what this uh, what this resolution was specific for, and yeah. Okay, certainly. Board members, is there any discussion before we vote on adding the agenda item as requested by Mr. Mahumza? Ms. Gover, if you can do a roll call vote. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Tracy? Hester? Ms. Mack is waiting to be admitted to the meeting. Thank you. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Ms. Mack? 
She's waiting to be admitted, Tracy. And Ms. Gover, you can proceed the vote without calling Ms. Max, and she was not here to listen to the discussion. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rock? Yes. The motion carries. Uh, in accordance with board policy 8314, a majority vote of the board is required to add or remove an agenda remove an item from the agenda. So Mr. Mahoom's motion has passed and I will uh, place that item during the student member of the board's report. Ms. Ms. Causey, I have a motion. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I motion that our next Board of Education meeting be held live. If Baltimore County Public Schools can, can, cannot host at Greenwood, then we host at a Baltimore County Public High School Auditorium. Thank you. Is there a second to adding Mr. McMillian's agenda item? Ms. Cosby, I'm not sure that that um, agenda item is in order because the decision to be able to host live is a health and public safety issue. And we can't make decisions to go against what are the health and public safety recommendations based on the pandemic? So it's not like the decision to host live is an arbitrary decision. Um, there are outside contributing factors that are outside of our control. Ms. Rowe, I hear your um, I hear your points, but I would suggest on this evening's agenda we have um, Discussion related to the reentry plan, which specifically speaks to uh, guidelines from the state, the state superintendent, um, and would be an opportunity for Mr. Uh, excuse me, for Dr. Daryl Williams to speak to um, facilities issues. And while we may not reach an, um, a decision around that factor, I think that it is an appropriate agenda item. So is there other board discussion before we have a roll call vote on Mr. McMillian's? Sure, this is Dr. We Williams. Need a second. Oh. We need a second for the motion. Is there I'll a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Dr. Williams? Um, so I appreciate the conversation. The staff and I are not prepared to provide any parameters related to the requests. Um, we may be able to provide some parameters and some alternatives uh, in our next board meeting, which is scheduled to be August. Um, but I just want to remind the board that schools and offices are still closed by the state superintendent. Mr. McMillian, do you have a response before we have a roll call vote? Well, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, we're in discussion about opening up our schools on September 8th, Tuesday after Labor Day. Uh, I think that we need to show the public that we can at least open up one high school auditorium and keep it within the guidelines. If it's less than 50 people, then it's less than 50. We socially distance, we wear masks, we take temperatures, we do everything that we can do. That, in my opinion, the public needs to, a voice to express their voice in other than email form. Uh, and so I think a school system our size, with 175 schools, we can prepare one high school auditorium in order to conduct a Board of Education meeting. That's my opinion. Thank you. So, Mr. McMillian, I would um, support adding the agenda item to have a brief conversation amongst the board members, understanding that we cannot reach a specific resolution based on staff not being prepared. Um, but I, I do think that there could be a brief discussion by the board if there is a consensus to add it as an agenda item. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Hen. Um, Mr. McMillian's motion was not to add an agenda item. I believe he's moving um, to um, have a live meeting, so to clarify his motion. Secondly, to clarify Dr. Williams' point or to reiterate, 
I don't believe we have the authority to act on Mr. McMillian's motion because we are under the direction of the state superintendent um, who has declared that offices are closed currently. So um, even if the board were to approve it, I don't believe we could act on that outside of the direction of the state superintendent. Um, point of inquiry too. Um, I was wondering, yes. is, this, is this to add it to the agenda or this is a resolution? Uh, my understanding and at the point we are in the meeting is that Mr. McMillian is asking to add an agenda item to discuss having an in-person board meeting. Yeah, that's what I was seconding for uh, the resolution. And that, that's actually, and that, was, that was not the wording of his motion. Correct. Mr. McMillian. Mr. McMillian, can you? Uh, that was my intention to add it as an agenda item. If I need to reword the motion, I'll reword it. That's yes, the Mr. next yes. meeting on, on the next meeting, unless we add something earlier in August or later in July, the next meeting is at, toward the end of August, which is six weeks away. So Mr. Thank McMillian, you. can you rephrase your motion to adding an agenda item? And then Mr. Mahumza will have to um, agreed that that's what he's seconding to i'll try i motion that our next i motion that we add to the agenda right. that our next board of education meeting be held live at a baltimore county high school if greenwood cannot host the the meeting then we search for a high school within the baltimore county boundaries thank you mr mahumza I agree uh, to add it to the agenda for discussion. Thank you. Any other discussion before I call a roll call vote? Ms. Gover? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The Ms. motion Paul, carries. Excuse me, Ms. Gover, can you add that agenda item um, after we discuss the re-entry plan? Ms. Yes. Causey? Yes, Ms. Rowe. In light of the length of our meeting, I move that for the uh, agenda item just passed that we suspend rules and limit uh, the time frame of discussion to five minutes. Is there a second? Second, Russ Kuhn. Any discussion before I have a roll call vote? Ms. Yes, Gover? This Actually, oh, this just, uh, yes. Is this just for Ms. McMillian's motion limiting debate, or is it for the mm -hmm. overall meeting? Just for that motion to limit it, limit the discussion of that motion to ten minutes or five minutes. Sorry. Thank you for the clarification, Ms. Gover. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager. Yes. Mr. Kim. Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Okay, that motion carries. Is that correct, Ms. Gover? Ms. Causey, it will require yeah. two-thirds of the votes. So it did require two. Did we achieve two-thirds, Ms. Did. Gover? Favor was nine. Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, thank you. So the revised agenda is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. 
to one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on our agenda is the new business personnel matters and for that we call on Ms. Maria Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, Offerman. Do I have a second? Second, Kuhn. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is amendment to superintendent's contract for 2020-2021. May I have a motion to accept an amendment to the superintendent's contract to not receive the 1% COLA for the 2020-2021 school year and that the superintendent's contract be amended accordingly for the 2020-2021 school year only? So moved, so moved at the you. superintendent's request. Second. Uh, so Ms. Rowe moved it and I'll have Mr. Kuhn second it. Um, board members, is there discussion? I did just want to state that it was at the superintendent's request um, that the board uh, vote on this matter. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rao? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item of business is E, New Business Administrative Appointments, and for that we call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, everyone. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal at Dogwood Elementary School, Assistant Principal at Hot Spring Elementary School, Specialist compliance in the office of special education compliance and placements director of data analytics division of research accountability and assessment and executive director of school support in the office of the community superintendents board members do i have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in exhibit e1 offerman yes is there a second kuhn second second thank you any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? 
está que Serve eight years in Hartford County Public Schools. Congratulations, Mr. Fair. Congratulations. Third candidate is Crystal Adams, specialist of compliance in the Office of Special Ed Placement. Um, actually, she's new to Baltimore County Public Schools. She's coming from Baltimore City Public Schools, where she served as the educational specialist uh, IEP development and implementation, a specialist for monitoring and compliance, an education associate um, in Baltimore City Public Schools, as well as an IEP team associate, special education teacher, and technical support personnel. So welcome, uh, Crystal Adams, to Baltimore County Public Schools, and congratulations. Yes, congratulations and welcome. Our next appointment is Asha Deganis, Dr. Deganis. Um, she's new to Baltimore County. She's coming as the Director of Data Analytics in the Division of Research, Accountability, and Assessment. She served as, as a statistician at the University of the Virgin Islands, Metrics and Measurement Analyst in the International Capital and Management Company, and Interim Director and Statistician at the University of the Virgin Islands. Welcome aboard. Congratulations and welcome to Baltimore County. Our last appointment is Dr. Miriam Yarborough as the Executive Director of School Support in the Office of the Community Superintendent. Currently, she's serving as the Acting Executive Director of School Support Secondary. She was hired in February 5th of this year as the Director of School Performance and she served Montgomery County in, in Montgomery County Public Schools for over 23 years. And she started her career in Baltimore County Public Schools, where she served three years from 1996 to 1999. Congratulations for this appointment. Yes, congratulations. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Ms. Crosby, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policies. And um, I'm going to list them all, but then we'll address them uh, one by one because I know there were some comments about some of the policies. Policy 0100 Equity, Policy 1230 Area Education Advisory Councils, Policy 3410, responsibilities and duties, which is renamed to transportation services, and policy 3420, routes and services, renamed to routes and bus stops, and policy 4101, drug-free workplace. And these recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit N at First Reader. Um, board members, I know there was discussion on policy 0100 equity. Um, are there board members that want to speak to that? 
Um, this is Erin Hager. I'll get started. I just had uh, two quick comments about the policy. I'm, I'm really glad that we tackled this and, and made significant changes from our last policy. It's um, really well done, and I, I applaud the committee for all their hard work on this policy. Um, I have two comments under number three, R and U. So um, letter U says that there will be a designated official or designated individual who's responsible for facilitating, monitoring, and implementing the system's equity initiatives. Um, I was wondering if that could be kind of risen up to the top, knowing that there's someone who's going to be overseeing all the letters of that in this section of the policy. Um, and additionally, letter R is about identifying the method of evaluating um, how we're going to measure the effect of this policy. And I'm really glad that there was an effort to include an evaluation in the policy language, which I think is really important with any policy. Um, I was curious about, uh, it's very loose, identify the method of evaluation. So will there be an opportunity once this method of evaluation is identified to kind of specifically include that in the policy language and any sort of amendment moving forward? Um, or was it intentionally kept loose for a reason? Hi, this is Ms. Scott. Um, and um, thank you for that, Dr. Hager. Um, is um, Dr. Lisa Williams available to address those specific questions? Um, Dr. Williams, is Dr. Lisa Williams available to address that? Ooh, I so do not believe that she is attending this evening's uh, meeting. Okay, then. Um, is Dr. Daryl Williams available to address that? Yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Scott, Who's speaking? What, what, it's Mr. Burke. I'm sorry. Oh, thank um, you. I would offer that, um, uh, Dr. Hager, that would be one of the things that we would probably iron out in the discussions during the equity committee meetings, uh, and it would be contained in the rule. Um, but we can certainly make those decisions within the equity committee meetings uh, as to how we want to work with that. Uh, I, I can work to get um, Dr. Williams to provide you an answer, uh, but I think that's probably how we would move forward. That's actually a great answer. I think it, I think it's appropriate to have it in the role, and um, I just think it has to be prioritized. So thank you. Board members, are there other uh, questions or discussions this is Lisa Mack. related to Policy 100? Good, Kathy, how are you? This is Lisa Mack. Um, yes. I have a question on the very last paragraph on page four, um, under whether and how the superintendent will report on the implementation of the policy. Bullet number two um, is a long bullet that says whether the discipline process has disproportionate impact on minority ELL status students or a negative impact on special education students. Um, can we enhance the policy to include how we will measure any disproportionate impact? So let me, let me. Ms. Mack, if you could state again which page and which line to, to which you're referring. The very last page um, in the uh, line 15. At least now it printed out for me. The understanding has been. So Somebody if I can ask phone, someone please. to mute, yes, we need to mute. Okay, thank you. Um, so policy 0100, there's page six, and then page seven just has the legal references. So again, I'm not seeing the paragraph. Miss Causey, you... this, this is Molly. This is on page six. If you go to page oh, six. Oh, I'm sorry, on my print it was four. Okay, that's a confusion. It's so page right, six, that confusion. Um, A2. So to clarify, my paper, whatever, whatever page says, whether and how the superintendent will report on the implementation of the policy. The superintendent will report to the board annually on the first thing is progress made towards increasing student achievement. The next thing is whether the dislip both. Oh, discipline process has any disproportionate impact on minority ELL status students or a negative impact on special education students. And I am asking that the policy be enhanced 
to show how we will measure that. Mrs. Causey, this is Mr. Burke again. Yes. Disproportiona disproportionality and the, the ratios required to identify disproportionality are set by MSDE. And I believe that the board receives um, reports on that um, throughout the year, uh, but uh, certainly Ms. Scott, I, I'm sorry, um, but I do believe that um, that data would, we would use the, um, the formulas for disproportionality set by the state. Thank you for that answer, Mr. Burke, but I, I would like to add, I, I don't know that I've ever seen that report, so if you could confirm that we are indeed receiving that, I would appreciate it. I will, thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Other board Causey. members? Yes, this is Ms. Pasteur. Good evening. Good um, evening. I, and, and I apologize because I don't have the documents, so I can't tell you where. But this is something um, possibly under definitions. Mr. Burke, maybe uh, you and Dr. Williams, Lisa Williams, can discuss this. Uh, but I want to see somewhere uh, in the beginning, in and again, maybe it's under definitions that there is um, a compilation of things there that cannot be conflated um, one with another. For example, um, uh, Esau versus race or immigration, immigrant versus race, that policy 0100 uh, captures a, a number of areas that need to be considered when we're talking about equity, but they cannot be meshed as one. Um, and, and I do think back to our conversation about the resolution um, that race is different from the characteristics or conditions. I hope you're following me because along the journey, we may come up with, let's put this so you can see my face. We might come up with um, uh, other characteristics um, or groups. For example, there might have been a time when we did not have, oh, since I started with Esau, I'll just say Esau. So I, I want the definitions clear in terms of what policy zero 100 is covering because down the road there might well be another group that would need to be added um, and we need to be clear and differentiate between a race and either conditions or characteristics mr burke uh, Ms. scott uh, dr hager are uh, Ms. Mack, are you with me understanding? Because that might just be a matter of discussion more than anything else. Ms. Pastor, I do believe I understand uh, your statements and we can certainly make sure we discuss that in the equity committee. And I'll make sure I have that discussion with uh, Dr. Williams, Dr. Lisa Williams. Um, the current policy that you see before you is modeled after a new policy from MSDE in Comar, and so the language mirrors that policy. But we can we can absolutely have that discussion. Yes, I just want to make sure that we don't see them all as one and in the same way, because how we handle each group will be differently in terms of equity. And as I said, along the way, we might come across a situation. Um, a condition or a group, not a race, uh, that might need some protection, if you will, under our equity policy. And I just want to make sure we're always aware of that and embracing that. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am, understood. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. And while it is appropriate for um, motions to be made around policies uh, this evening for changes that board members um, may want the full board to consider. Um, there is also the opportunity at second reader if there was any specific language uh, modifications that you wanted to offer 
uh, that there would be the opportunity at the uh, when this policy comes up for a second reader. Are there other board members with comments or discussion around policy 0100? I just had a quick question, um, and this can go to the um, equity committee um, chair, vice chair, or staff. Um, the last paragraph in policy 0100 uh, talks about in support of the goals of this educational equity policy, the board has established a standing committee on educational equity to implement this policy and to report quarterly to the board. Um, we, if we have this policy named equity, not educational equity policy, and I just wanted to make sure, um, and maybe Ms. Howie can chime in, that that's not a conflict. And also, right now, our equity committee is named equity committee. It's not named educational equity committee. And I just wanted to check that with Comar, does it require us to name our committee educational equity, or does it suffice being equity? So first of all, let me apologize for the background noise. Uh, but I, Comar does not require that a local board of education have um, a committee at all. Okay. So then I would, um, I would move to just correct the language in paragraph 5B on page 6 to um, remove the word educational on line 28 and to remove the word educational on line. in order to be consistent with the name of the policy and also the name of the committee. And I think that we could agree that the equity relates to the entire school system. So it relates to our staff um, as well. And um, so I just think that would be more inclusive. Okay, so you would like to take it educational because you don't feel it's inclusive of all of BCPS? You feel it's exclusive? Yes and to be consistent with the name on the policy and to be consistent with the uh, name of the committee that the board established. Ms. Clausey, th this is Erin Hager again. There are two definitions that are separate. I actually wrote about this as well. Um, definition E and definition E are um, separating out definitions of educational equity equity. They are very similar in the way that they are worded, um, so I, I wasn't sure about. And I just point that out because um, either way, I feel like it. By the way, someone has background noise. Sorry, hard to uh, hear myself. Did we lose Dr. Hager? No, I, 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 there was some feedback. I just wanted to point out that there are two separate definitions of equity and educational equity in the in the policy currently. So um, I don't know that you need to remove educational throughout the policy because it's defined separately, or whether you would choose to merge the two definitions into a single concept. Um, thank you. I'll I'll withdraw my motion based on your comments. Board members, any other discussion? Okay, moving to the next policy, policy 1230, community relations, community involvement. Um, I did wanna make one um, motion related to policy 1230. In it, the, um, dra the policy on page one, line 19, deletes paragraph C, which says the board has the authority to appoint additional citizen advisory councils or committees as needed. And I would make a motion to add that statement back in. Is there a second? I'll second that. 
Second. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Just to speak to my motion, uh, the board just recently established the equity committee. So I think this board um, does believe it has the authority and it also does want to uh, maintain that flexibility in the future. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call vote? Uh, Ms. Causey, I'm sorry. I need to hear your motion one more time, please. Um, I make a motion to add back to policy 1230, the statement, it's page one, line 19, labeled paragraph C. The board has the authority to appoint additional citizen advisory councils or committees as needed. Thank you. Ms. Causey, can I comment on that? Yes. I would just like to point out that whether the policy says the board has the authority or not, the board has the authority. So it's clearer for the public to actually say it. Thank you. Are there other comments? May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Fozzie? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Board members, was there any other discussion on policy 1230? Hearing none, is there any discussion on policy 3410? Hearing none, is there any discussion on policy 3420? And is there any discussion on policy 4101? Okay, hearing none. Uh, may I have a motion to accept the policies as amended on uh, as listed in exhibit nine. So moved. So moved. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hecker? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomser? Mr. Mahomser? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you, the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is public comment. Because the board is meeting virtually for today's meeting, only written public comments can be accepted. Comments may be emailed to boe at bcps.org, and these comments will be distributed to the Board of Education members. Public comments that are requested to be published publicly and received before 11.59 p.m. the day before the board meeting are attached in board docs under this agenda item. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens, and as appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. I do just wanna make a brief comment that we have received uh, a great number of public comment recently, and they are attached to board docs. Uh, the next item is policies for public comment. 
For today's scheduled meeting, public comment for the following board policies will be accepted online or via email for the policies we just uh, reviewed. Policy 0100, policy 1230, policy 3410, policy 3420, and policy 4101. Written public comments may be submitted for the appropriate policy on the BCPS webpage under policies and rules, policies available for public comment or may be sent to boe at bcps.org. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. So good evening again. Uh, I would like to start with a warm welcome to our newest board member, Josh Mahamza. Uh, Josh is a rising senior at Dundalk High School who has distinguished himself both academically and through community service. I had the pleasure of um, talking with Josh uh, during his orientation and during the race and racism town hall meeting that we had. So welcome aboard. Uh, many of you met Josh during last week's conversation on race and racism in American Baltimore County Public Schools. All our panelists did an outstanding job, but I would particularly like to commend our students for their courage and honesty. We will continue discussing race with our schools and offices in order to better support our students and staff of color. Um, I'll be brief with my report. I just want to end with tonight. I will look forward, I look forward to the board's approval regarding my proposed strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence, it has been a pleasure to get to know our community during the past year, and I'm eager to move ahead. And finally, I appreciate the feedback from across the community through surveys and advisory groups to guide our plans for how schools will reopen. Uh, BCPS leaders continue working towards a recommendation to me for our recovery plan. So thank you, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item is the chair's report, and I'm just going to be very brief and um, uh, dovetail with everything that Dr. Williams has said. I will just briefly make a comment about the race and racism, racism conversation, uh, of which I was pleased to uh, take part and really to just take part in listening to so many uh, wonderful observations and uh, inspirational um, discussion. I did want to say to our community that this board is dedicated to the work of equity and that if you would want to go and review our policies 0100, policy 0200, and policy 0300 and see, in fact, where they represent anti-racist efforts to do better. Uh, one of the things that was brought up was related to staffing and staffing in support of our students, social, emotionally, and also in academic achievement. So just know that the board uh, is dedicated to working on that with Dr. Williams and his team. And next, we will call on our student member of the board, Mr. Muhamza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 10 years ago, my journey in the school system began I was an eager little boy ready to assimilate to the marquee American system of learning, which prior to that was a dream only manifested in movies and TV. As an immigrant from the East African countries of Rwanda and Uganda, I knew right away there would be many hurdles to over, for me to overcome. I was, a, I was pessimistic for what was to come. But what I remember of this moment wasn't just the fear of the unknown, but the hope and optimism I had for this new journey. And so, I might not be able to fully retell this very important moment in my life. Like, did I have a Spider-Man or Green Ninja Turtle book bag? I don't remember, but it's okay. What is important and what I do remember is the look on my mother's face as I entered my elementary schoolhouse and waved her goodbye. My story and up upbringing cannot be told without her first acknowledging her. My mother, like many parents in our school system who immigrated their families to this country, sacrificed a lot just for the opportunity to better the lives of their children. The importance of education to me is a lesson I learned through my mom's lived experiences. Her story consists of overcoming a war and genocide that took the lives of many of her family members and destabilized her country, economic hardships, and authoritarian regimes, just to name a few. 
But with all these plights, she never held endless feelings of anger or desired revenge. The only thing that could rectify her struggles was giving her children an opportunity to an equitable education and opportunity to career paths, all opportunities that she did not have. This was her American dream, a dream that many families sacrificed all they had just to open doors for their families. When I was campaigning for this position, as I visited and heard from many of the diverse voices of our school system, I knew it was imperative to have the same mindset as my mother did. Work hard and even sacrifice some in the pursuit of bettering the lives of others. In my Catholic faith, I refer to this as, a God, as God's calling. An essential question I ask myself is, what is God calling you to do? This message in our secular institution still holds to a true. It's not God calling us, but our children, our teachers, and all our stakeholders. From the disparities in the achievement gap, teacher support, language barriers, overcrowded schools and buses, fragile school climate and infrastructure, the ongoing mental health crisis, and the, and the many important issues that are prevalent in our county. Team BCPS is calling on all of you to listen with and act with prudence, to exercise your duty and authority whilst listening to the recommendation of our superintendent, his staff, and the many highly qualified profession, professionals in our school system. To not politicize the board, this board, and most importantly, to energize and welcome this, the perspective of our of students in all manners that affect their lives. As us Gen Zers like to say, don't be boomers. And for those wondering what that means, you don't have to Google it or even go on TikTok. Just listen to what BCPS is calling on you to do. I started my campaign with the phrase, together united, change is inevitable. These words pervade in my heart and vision of our school system. Today and every day, I call on everyone, not just my fellow board members, but our superintendent, the central staff, each individual school and its leaders, our teachers, our students, and every stakeholder in this amazing school system. Team BCPS, together, change will come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Um, also, at this time, we add it to the agenda. You wanted to speak to the um, student member of the board, Mr. Omar Rashid's resolution. So you can do that at this time. Yes, uh, I'm not going to take a long time on this. Uh, when the board passed this resolution, there was unanimity on what this resolution was and what's meant. what was its purpose. Um, I think it deserves the title. It was an important piece of uh, it was an important uh, resolution, and I think it will be important to title it as such. Uh, I don't have much comment. Mr. Mahumza, I would just ask you to clearly state what you would like the title oh, to be. I apologize. Um, the title will be uh, the Black Lives Matter resolution. So that is a motion by Mr. Mahumza to change the to title the resolution, which was previously untitled, uh, to Black Lives Matter resolution. Is there a second? Second. second. This Molly. is Ms. Pasteur. I beat you to it. No, you did not. <laughs> <laughs> we might need to flip a you, coin. She was an echo. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, uh, is there discussion? Yes, I'd like to speak to it. I'm, I'm, Glad I didn't know what was going to become of any of the after conversation, but I am glad that it was brought up. And it um, does speak to my comments in terms of the equity policy, uh, because Mr. Rashid was clear in saying Black Lives Matter. And than the other pieces uh, that are included in zero one hundred were brought into that. And I remembered thinking then, and I remember, and I know I think now will always think that I am not a condition. So all people, all people can uh, be learning disabled, all people, um, any any race could uh, be an immigrant from somewhere. America was bred 
on immigrants, either voluntary or involuntary. So I just want that to be clear. That's why Mr. Rashid was so clear about what he wanted it titled, because it was about a race, not about conditions or circumstances or disabilities, et cetera. So, um, Mr. Mahamza, I, I thank you for uh, bringing that back for our attention. Ms. Causey? Uh, yes, Ms. Rowe. So I would just like to um, point out that while I agree with the language Black Lives Matter, there is an incorporated political organization that is entitled Black Lives Matter. And if we're going to title the resolution, we need to have something that explicitly states that the Board of Education does not either endorse or condemn any political organizations because we are a nonpartisan body. And just like we wouldn't put Republican or Democrat in a resolution title, it's problematic if we have that be the title without also saying that we are not endorsing a political incorporated organization. And I would also like to point out that the list of different people that are listed in our equity policy are actually listed on the Black Lives Matter organization's this, this woman... website. So and I'm not really sure why we're making that distinction. Uh, uh, may I respond, uh, Ms. Causey, since Ms. Uh, Rowe is referring to uh, what I just said. I'm making the distinction be, uh, because Mr. Rashid wanted to speak to Black Lives Matter. She is correct. Ergo, my point that Black Lives Matter, those people who uh, speak to that and who march to that, et cetera, do include groups because they understand, just as I just articulated, that people of color, specifically in this case, black people, can be any one of those groups, but they in and of themselves are not racist. The second piece I want to point out, Black Lives Matter was formed after uh, the killing of Trayvon Martin. They do not, individuals in the group might endorse a candidate, might endorse some sort of position, but as a group, that baseline, what undergirds the group is a matter of saying and doing exactly what it says, Black Lives Matter, and raising that up uh, in terms of a historical context. They do not, as an organization, attribute or attach itself. And, and I agree. We must not conflate what anyone else has said about the group being connected. Thank goodness that the one person who made his comments that set a fury politically um, about what the group was to mean and its connection with uh, the police, et cetera. Thank goodness we do not hold ourselves, any group, a no group holds itself to what any one member of that group might say. We'd all be in a barrel of trouble if we all became connected with what one person said without permission of the group. So Black Lives Matter as a group has never talked about disenfranchising any part of this government or this country. It is about exactly what it says. But I do appreciate that you reiterated my point, that that's why they embrace other people in our zero 100, because they are groups. And 10, 15 years ago, we would not have had, if we had a zero 100, possibility we would not have had an LGBT um, as consideration. And that's why we are open. Thank you. 
Yes, hi, Ms. this is Ms. Scott. Um, thank you so much, um, Ms. Pastor. I think it just bears um, listening to what Mr. What, uh, Mr. Mahumza said is taking on what Mr. Rashid um, started. It's a Black Lives Matter resolution. What he is saying is that at DCPS, we value the lives of our black students. We value the lives of our black educators. We value the lives of black administrators. We value black lives at DCPS. That is what the resolution was written for, and that is what he's saying. When we add additional things and, and, and try to water it down or, or, or turn it into something else that it is not, takes away from the resolution and from what he stated. He's simply having the title match what was in the resolution. And I think we need to focus on that, not go off on a tangent about something else, and simply vote on the title to fit the resolution as Mr. Mahomza simply and so eloquently stated. Thank you. And Ms. Causey, this is Molly. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, I see your hand up. Um, I cannot believe we are having this conversation after having the race and racism conversation. If you had listened to the children, and I always say listen to the children, Black Lives Matter isn't a political issue. It is a human rights issue a moral issue, an issue of ethics. In fact, politics is woefully unequipped to address this issue. Caring about another life is not political. The fact that you bring this up time and again is disturbing to me, it's troubling. And after having listened to the children, 115,000 of them, that the fact that I, as a non-Black person, have to come here and defend it is, is very, very troubling to me. Thank you. This is Mr. Offerman. I would like to move the question. Mr. Offerman, I just wanted to make a brief statement, but uh, is, is there a second to Mr. Offerman's moving the question? I second it. Second. I second that. Wow, that um, was a trio. I second it. Okay, oh, yeah. thank you. Okay. <laughs> is there any discussion to uh, moving the vote? Okay, it takes a two-third majority. If I could have a roll call vote, please. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Penn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? No. Thank you. So the motion carries, and now we are going to Chair, vote. I'd like to make a second motion. Well, we we can't make a second motion. That motion was to move the vote, which means now we were with no more discussion. We will vote on your motion to name the resolution Black Lives Matter. So may I have a roll call vote for that, please, Ms. Gover? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Posse? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? I'm confused on what we're voting for now. The vote is to rename the resolution to Black Lives Matter resolution. No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Mack, yes. I'm sorry, Ms. Mack. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Abstain. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank May you. Motion now, Manager. Yes, Mr. Mahamza. Okay. Uh, I make a motion to direct the superintendent to investigate the a potential prohibition by the board of hateful speech and symbols, which include, but not limited to, Confederate flags, swastikas, and other symbols uh, that the superintendent uh, determines to be appropriate in schools. 
then request that the superintendent make a report to the board no later than uh, January 19th, 2021. I second that, second. Lisa Mack. I second Makita Scott. Um, so Ms. Mack seconded that and um, Mr. Mahumza, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, um, we have all received all the many emails uh, with uh, concerning this ban of hateful symbols in our schools. And the reason for this motion is because this issue has been prevalent in our county for a long time. Yes, that there is laws that give our superintendent and principals the right uh, to prohibit certain dress uh, attire. But uh, as you know from numerous emails, um, the ban on dress code is not being enforced uh, uniformly and consistently uh, because uh, our dress policy 5520 alludes to this but is not as clear and concise regarding the issue of symbols. Uh, for example, gangs and sexual subjective images are explicitly mentioned, but this is not really uh, the same and sometimes students abuse this policy. Uh, and the reason why I want the superintendent to make a report on this is because um, we, we don't want to move too fast on this issue. I think the superintendent has to provide data and also have Ms. Howie and the legal counsel team look at this um, thoroughly uh, before we make a ban in, in the near future. Thank you. Board member, is there uh, other discussion? I did just want to say that the policy review committee did address these concerns and there was conversation about policies that do um, allow the superintendent to implement rules and to have uh, the principals implement rules and that there was going to be further discussion. So I would just ask Dr. Williams uh, if he would like to comment before we vote. I just asked um, Ms. Trait, let's go over to reread that motion, please. And I'm going to ask Mr. Mahumza to, uh, <laughs> since I don't have a written version of that. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. A motion to direct the superintendent to investigate the potential prohibition by the board of hateful speech and symbols, which include but not limited to Confederate flags, swastikas, and other symbols that the superintendent determines to be inappropriate in schools and then re further request that the superintendent make a report to the board no later than January 19th, 2021. Thank you. And um, Ms. Causey, I, I, you brought the, uh, I, I know that the policy review co uh, committee did review uh, this matter, but uh, nothing much came out of that. Uh, discussion and I just feel that if we ask our superintendent to thoroughly examine this and bring us the data and the legal team has looked at it I think it, this issue can be resolved in an expeditious manner thank you thank you and and it was my understanding that the superintendent is and is evaluating that he he does also believe it's a priority so um, I'm supportive because I I believe it's it's in the works any other board members with comments before we take a vote? Ms. Gover? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item K, new business action taken in closed session. There uh, was action that was taken in closed session, so at this time I would ask the board to... Um, Excuse me. Do I have a motion to approve the action that was taken in closed session? So moved, Lisa Mack. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Hen. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. 
Mr. Coombs? Yes. Ms. Pesture? Ms. Pesture? Mr. Offerman? Oh, I'm sorry. I was muted. I wasn't okay. present, so I abstained. Oh, you're correct. So you abstained? I, I guess I wasn't at the closed session. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Mr. Mahomes? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joe? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. I'm sorry? Abstain. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Seven in favor. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item L, new business recovery plan. For that, we uh, ask Dr. Adams and Ms. Burnop to come forward to present. And following the presentation, there will be uh, time for discussion if the board so desires. Thank you, thank you, and good evening, board members and Dr. Williams. Tonight, I'm here with Ms. Barbara Burnop to provide an update on our recovery planning efforts. Tonight's presentation will include scenario-based thinking and has been shared previously portions of this with the Board of Education Curriculum Committee and stakeholders, as well as updates on current work across the organization. I'd like to stress that what will be shared tonight, tonight is not a finalized plan, but will show the parameters that have guided our thinking to date while we gathered stakeholder input and feedback. As um, Ms. Causey said, there'll be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Mr. Corns, if I could have the next slide. We thought it would be important to share the local landscape of COVID-19 in both Maryland and specifically Baltimore County. These maps both show the differential impact of COVID-19 on our Maryland community by county, which is the blue chart on the left, and within Baltimore County by zip code, which is the red chart on the right. On each map, darker shades of either blue or red indicate higher numbers of confirmed COVID-19 cases. As of July 1st, Baltimore County alone had over 8,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19. You can see that some areas of Baltimore County have been impacted by the virus more so than others, although there are cases in all areas of the county. When we look at this map, it helps us understand the local and national conversation about whether we should reopen, how fast we should reopen, or whether we should remain closed. As has been stated by my um, colleague, Dr. Lisa Williams, we're all in the same boat, but we're not all in the, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat because some Baltimore County communities are feeling the impact of the virus to a greater degree than are some others. Mr. Corns, if I could have the next slide. Thank you. Our recovery and planning efforts are guided by both the governor's and the state superintendent's plans for recovery. As such, at every point, staff are aligning our proposals for recovery to the recovery phases as outlined in these documents. Maryland Together, MSDE's recovery plan for education includes non-negotiables that each local school system must include in their recovery plan. I wanted to take a moment to briefly share those with you. School systems must publish their recovery plans by August 14th. The recovery plan must reflect the system's equity plan. School systems must establish a recovery stakeholder planning group. Early in the school year, school systems must determine where students are instructionally. School systems must ensure that the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards are taught. School systems must follow the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. School systems must follow procedures that are developed by MSDE the Maryland Department of Health and guidance from the CDC for an individual who tests positive for COVID-19. School systems must follow safety protocols for the collection of materials, cleaning of schools and facilities, daily cleaning and nutrition as established by MSDE in collaboration with the Maryland Department of Health 
and CDC guidance. School systems must follow protocols for the safe transportation of students, both to and from school. School systems must develop a plan for monitoring and tracking attendance when students are engaged in distance learning. School systems must develop a plan for communication. The COVID-19 checklist included in the Maryland Together Recovery Plan must be utilized in the development of each school system's recovery plan. And finally, the Maryland Public Secondary Schools Athletic Association Roadmap Forward for Interscholastic Athletics, that's a mouthful, must align with MSDE and local school systems educational and health and safety decisions in order for athletics to resume during stage one or stage two. Thank you, Mr. Corns. As Dr. Williams has stated, BCPS has a design team working through our recovery planning. The team is comprised of um, senior executive directors, that's myself and Mrs. Burnop, executive directors from all portions of the organization, including curriculum and instruction, school support and achievement, school climate and safety, human resources, research accountability and assessment, organizational effectiveness, and business services. Uh, among the design team are two of our staff attorneys from the Office of Law. And additionally, we invite and include directors and coordinators as needed. And what I want to share is while, for example, while our Office of Health Services reports to Dr. Nieves and Dr. Zarchin, we feel it was really critical to have our coordinator of health services who's in daily contact with the Maryland Department, I mean, the Baltimore County Department of Health to be a part of the design team and a part of all of our meetings. The design team meets twice weekly and subgroups emerge as needed to explore different topic areas, among them health and mitigation strategies, transportation, facilities, food and nutrition services. The design team was charged with two deliverables that are on your screen. The first was to design a re-engagement program for students with whom we've had no contact during the continuity of learning in the spring and the second deliverable was to provide models for reopening given the various stages of COVID-19 spread. When we began, um, when we began thinking about our reentry planning, we thought it was important to have guiding principles against which we could compare any plans that we considered. Our guiding principles become our lampposts that help us remember our commitments, and I'd like to take just a moment to share them with you. First and foremost, we understand fully that we're in the middle of a global health crisis. And so during such, we want to promote the health, welfare, and safety of our students, our staff, and our families, while at the same time attempting to maximize learning opportunities for students since learning is our core, our core purpose. The research tells us that when we can come together, either virtually or in, per or in person, that social emotional learning will be critical and community building will be a critical facet for both our staffs and our students. So we want to prioritize that. We of course wish to provide high quality teaching and learning to all students. We understand that we had educational inequities prior to the onset of COVID-19 in Maryland and Baltimore County and that those inequities have likely grown. And so we want to work to mitigate those inequities wherever possible. One of the ways we might go about doing so is providing additional supports and differential learning opportunities for the students for whom the students who need them the most examples would include students with interrupted access to education those students um, with whom we lost contact during the continuity of learning students with disabilities our english learners and of course our students living in poverty with a clear understanding that income and housing insecurity has likely increased across our county um, with the growing unemployment rate. We also want to finally uh, provide our students and families with the resources that enable them to participate fully in our instructional program. And the board has seen this commitment and the public through the acquisition and distribution of Chromebooks and the acquisition and distribution, for example, of mobile hotspots to families that were without internet service. In partnership and discussion with our local health department officials, it's important to share that any decision to open schools, how schools reopen, or whether to continue with remote learning will be conditions-based and not time-based. 
The prevalence and spread of the virus will dictate how and when we can reopen schools, along with directives which may come from state or local officials. As such, we will not have a predetermined timeline for the resumption of particular activities, but rather will allow the conditions of the environment and the health guidance to determine when different activities should or shouldn't take place. Our operational def definition of recovery planning is everything that occurs after the end of school year, after the end of the school year in June. So we think of recovery as a continuum of services as shown on the screen before you. First, we had our continuity of learning, which took us to the end of the school year. Now, during the summer, we have our traditional summer programs running, each being offered in a virtual format. Those programs include our extended school year services for students with disabilities, our extended year learning program for middle and high school students, our extended learning opportunity program for our students who attend Title I schools, and our summer ESOL programming. In addition to our traditional summer programs, we also have for this summer our universal summer hike, which as you know is an online adaptive self-paced academic support for any student who's returning to BCPS in the fall. Finally, and as mentioned previously, we are designing a re-engagement program that will support students as we transition into the start of the 2021 school year. So let's begin with our re-engagement programming. Board members had been receiving during the continuity learning weekly updates regarding student engagement during that time and are likely familiar with the percentages of students with whom we have not had consistent contact and engagement. In this program, we'll seek to reach out and re-engage with those students. As a reminder, and for the public's information, overall, we had approximately 5.9% of elementary students not engaged and 4.8% of secondary students not engaged. The program design based on principal focus groups would be an individual site-based design tailored to the school and community needs, knowing that principals and their staff understand why their students are not engaged to a large degree. The re-engagement programs would uh, be timed to begin before the start of the school year. Uh, they will be designed by the building leadership with support from central office staff with a focus on social emotional learning and possibly literacy and mathematics. And then of course, options for the daily program or the timing are all under discussion and will be determined as schools develop their plans. In terms of planning for the start of the 2021 school year, we've been considering multiple reopening scenarios that, we, that would be conditions based and in alignment with the state and MSDE's recovery planning stages. Scenario one would be a continuation with an enhanced version of remote learning. Scenario two would be reopening schools with some combination of in-person and remote learning. And scenario three would be reopening schools with 100% in-person learning. On the next few slides, I'll go into more detail about the conditions under which each scenario may occur. Scenario one is an enhanced version of our current remote learning plan. Um, the assumption under this model is that the state of Maryland and Baltimore County are in phase one of reopening. Um, during and using this model, we would offer instruction that is both synchronous, live or asynchronous anytime. Enhancements, however, will be made based on all of the feedback and the lessons learned that we've um, discovered in talking with our students, their parents, teachers, and administrators. Scenario two has schools opening with a combination of in-person instruction and remote learning. Under this scenario, not all students return to school at the same time. This model assumes that Maryland and Baltimore County are in phase two of reopening, that mitigation strategies, including strict social distancing, are required, and that all students have live instruction with teachers daily, either in person or online. Under this model, and as you can see on the slide before you, schools may open with a limited capacity, 30 to 35% or 50% capacity, depending on current mitigation and social distancing guidelines. 
This could mean that students would alternate weeks of instruction. Students, if they were alternating weeks of instruction, students would attend school for four days during their assigned week and have an online instruction day on Friday. Our teachers would be on duty Monday through Friday with Friday held as a day for both professional learning and teacher planning. The MSDE recovery plan and the health department recommends that we cohort students. And so we are considering cohorting them by address. And just so I can ensure that we're all understanding what we mean, um, when, this, when the health department tells us to understand a cohort, they mean knowing that a group of students or children or adults are together and with whom they have daily contact. And so in some of our thinking, we began with the idea of exploring whether we could possibly cohort students by their home address in that way um, in households with multiple siblings, both older and younger, those siblings are attending school during the same days and or weeks and not attending school during the same days and or weeks. Scenario three would be the eventual reopening of schools for 100% in-person learning. Under this model, we assume that Baltimore County and Maryland are in phase three of reopening. We assume that mitigation measures such as enhanced cleaning, screening, isolation of sick persons, and enforcement of quarantines would still be required. We also assume that social distancing requirements at that time may have been relaxed and face coverings may then be optional. It would be under these conditions that we would consider all students and staff returning to school buildings. We value stakeholder input and feedback and have actively sought to obtain it. A total of 16 stakeholder input and feedback sessions were held during the last two weeks of June. Those sessions included sessions with our five bargaining units, ABCO, ACE, ESPBC, ASME, and OPE. In addition, we met with the Superintendent Student Advisory, Student Advisory Council with a combination of Baltimore County Student Council members. And we also met with the Superintendent's Parent, Teacher, Business, and Principal Advisory Councils. We had a meeting with all of the Area Advisory Councils. We also met with the International Parent Leadership Academy. Those are parents of students who all, for whom English is not the first language. Their students are, are among our English learners. We met with our, both our special education and our gifted and talented citizen advisory groups. We met with the NAACP. And additionally, because of the differential impact, we held an input session with parents, students, and staff from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. In addition to those 16 feedbacks and input sessions, we launched a public survey to gain additional input from students, family, community members, and staff. The survey was translated into five languages and garnered more than 5,100 response, 51,000, excuse me, responses. Um, for comparison purposes, the survey was open for a week and we obtained um, almost 52,000 responses. Our stakeholder survey that is usually open between five and six weeks, it's between 70 and 80,000 responses. So there was great interest in our survey. Lastly, our recovery plan stakeholder group is another avenue that will ensure that we have ongoing input and feedback. On the next slides, we'll share information regarding uh, BCPS efforts to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. During a pandemic, health, public health measures to slow the spread are critical. Our Office of Health Services used guidance from the CDC, State Health Department, and expert groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics to provide a high level framework for mitigation in BCPS. There are six components to the mitigation framework. Strategies under each component have been selected to reduce coronavirus transmission. The first component is social distancing with which we're now pretty familiar. Social distancing strategies interrupt virus spread from one person to another and include a variety of things including telework and or remote learning, six foot separation and face coverings. The second component is screening. Screening strategies are meant to interrupt virus transmission at the school and office level 
by reducing the chances that a person who is infectious is in contact with others. The third strategy is regular and thorough cleaning, both of our buildings and our hands. Although most, most virus transmission is person to person, keeping our facilities and hands clean will reduce the spread of all infections, including COVID-19. The fourth component is called healthy operating. Strategies in this area interrupt virus transmission in several ways. Maximizing mixing of outdoor air with our ventilation systems will dilute virus and reduce the risk of spread, while eliminating the shared use of items will reduce transmission between persons. The fifth component addresses how we will respond when a BCPS community member has COVID-19 or becomes ill during the school or work day. These strategies provide guidance that will ensure that we don't have uncontrolled or excessive spread within our schools. Our final strategy is communication. Without an effective communication plan, all of these strategies are just ideas. The communication strategies will ensure that our mitigation plans are fully implemented and understood. To that end, our Office of Health Services has created mitigation guidelines aligned to each phase of recovery, examples of which are displayed on this slide. Some mitigation strategies will be the same regardless of level of disease in the community. However, other strategies may need to be adjusted based on whether the county and state are in phase one, two, or three of reopening. The model provides high level strategies for each component at each phase. And now I'll turn things over to Ms. Berna. Um, thank you, Dr. Adams. Good evening, board members and superintendent. The Department of School Safety is carefully reviewing student protocols and procedures to determine if any changes need to be made to protect students, staff, and visitors. Students and staffs must staff must comply with mitigation guidelines developed by the Office of Health Services. Students and staff will participate in one evacuation drill to assure that they are prepared to respond to an emergency that requires them to leave their building. Visitors will be limited to only those who must come to a school or an office and by appointment only. Screening of visitors will occur prior to admission into the main office. The mission of the Office of Transportation remains safe, efficient, effective service with stat the safety of our students, staff, and attendants as the top priority. The Office of Transportation is committed to providing a service model that follows the roadmap to recovery, CDC recommendations, and industry best practices, which include guidance on operating and cleaning procedures. Social distancing on school buses I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> Social distancing on school buses can be challenging given the inflexibility of the environment and necessary transportation safety measures. Current social distancing guidance ranges from three feet to six feet to one student per seat row or staggered by row and seat. As a result, the, these models change the rated capacity of most buses from 64 passengers to between nine and 21 students. The images on the slide show what social distancing would look like with one student for every seat or one student in staggered seating. Last year, over 80,000 students rode a, rode a BCPS bus twice a day as their transportation to and from school. The Office of Transportation is working to establish procedures that ensure our buses are properly cleaned and disinfected through all recommended procedures and regular at regular intervals. Providing a safe environment for eating while still complying with cohorting, face covering, and social distance guidelines will be a challenge. Models are being discussed for using the cafeteria as well as other school spaces, spaces including the classroom. If only a portion of the students are in school, plans are being developed to continue with curbside pickup for other eligible students not in the schoolhouse. The Office of Food and Nutrition is hopeful that additional waivers will be granted by the federal government to assist 
in our pro the providing of food as we were able to do this spring. Food service workers have been trained and are complying with food serving and cleaning requirements. Next slide. Many of the challenges facing the Department of Facilities exist no matter how many students are in the building. The Department of Facilities is already reviewing building ventilation, access and size of the nursing suites, isolation needs for students suspected of contracting the coronavirus, the setup of classrooms, review of procedures for student drop-off and pickup, signage for hallways and restrooms, setup of the main office for screening visitors and protecting staff, as well as ongoing enhanced cleaning schedules. Maintaining recommended social distancing requirements is only possible if the classroom has less than 33% of the students. The more the students in the school, the more pressure there will be on cleaning schedules and the more resources they will be needed to clean the schools. Um, next slide, and I'll turn the time back to Dr. Adams. Thank you, Barbara. Um, as I mentioned previously, a research and guidance into the reopening of schools stresses the importance of social emotional learning and supports for community building. To support recovery, the Department of Social Emotional Supports is developing support documents, recommendations, and guidance in the following areas which should occur irrespective of phase of recovery or any reopening plan. Among them, we want to provide space and time for children to unpack, discuss, and share their experiences. We, want, we wish to provide increased support for those who experienced um, loss. We wanna offer attention and support to students who are experiencing anxiety about returning back to school or current conversations about the impact of racism. We also want to ensure that our service delivery models and staff, our support staff, is our psychologists, our school social workers, our counselors, our nurses, and our people personnel workers, excuse me, are um, really poised to meet the most pressing needs of our students. And we wish to expand adult social emotional learning and literacy in order to support students and connect to students with whom we've had little or no engagement. Regarding teaching and learning, curriculum resources are being developed to support agility, the shift between and among instructional models. Diagnostic tasks um, to assess unfinished learning will be developed. Let me explain what I mean by unfinished learning. During our initial closure, which began on March 13th and the continuity of learning, the academics department under the leadership of Megan Shea identified for each subject and course a streamlined set of learning objectives for each week. We knew we couldn't teach all of the learning objectives during the closure, so the most critical standards and objectives were identified. Knowing that there were certain standards that were not identified for a targeted focus during the continuity of learning, we know that that learning need not be measured because it wasn't intended to occur. Instead, our diagnostic tasks will focus on the learning we anticipated would happen, yet may remain unfinished. Given that information, our curricular scope and sequence adjustments will be made to support gaps created or widened during the spring and will serve as a foundation and on-ramp to maintain alignment for completing this, academic, this coming academic year. We know we need to provide and will provide professional learning support specifically to our teachers, our paraeducators, and our administrators. And the exact scope of this work will be dependent upon the reopening plan and design that is finally implemented um, when that information is made public. And so this concludes our update on recovery planning and BCPS. We will continue to uh, analyze input and feedback and that feedback will inform a deeper design of reopening models now that we have feedback under each scenario. As you know, all local school systems are working within the MSDE requirement for publishing their reentry plans, and that deadline is by August 14th. And with that, uh, Ms. Burnop and I will are happy to take any questions you might have. Hi, this so, is Mr. Mack. I have a num I I'm have sorry. three questions I'd like to ask. I'm sorry, Ms. Mack. I want to make a oh, closing sorry. statement. I'm sorry. 
thank you, Dr. Adams and Ms. Burnout, for presenting the recovery plan and the three scenarios to the board. Board members, as we move forward to the opening of schools in the fall, there are a number of unknowns and moving parts that have yet to be considered. However, we started, as was reported, our recovery with this summer with online learning, with the summer learning hike and the traditional summer programs, which included extended learning opportunities, English for speakers of other languages, extended school year and extended year program. I'm gonna read a portion of this article that uh, entitled Science and the Community Circumstances Must Guide Decision-Making. And it starts off with the American Academy of, of uh, Pediatrics, American Federation of Teachers, National Education Association, and the superintendent, School Superintendents Association. And in this article, it states, returning to school is important for the healthy development and well-being of children, but we must pursue reopening in a way that is safe for all students, teachers, and staff. Science should drive decision-making on safely reopening schools. Public health agencies must make recommendations based on evidence, not politics. We should leave it to the health experts to tell us when the time is best to open up school buildings and listen to educators and administrators to shape how we do it. So that's just a portion of that article that I found interesting. Schools are developing re-engagement plans for students who may have been uh, disengaged or at risk prior to March 16th. Our central office will be working with each principal to develop these next steps. In some con cases, continue these actions, um, but with support. So the opening of this school year will be different. And not only do we have to address the teaching and learning, but the social well-being of our staff and students. So to that end, I am leaning towards a virtual return with some type of phase and approach after we open. Perhaps looking at the transition years, particularly those in kindergarten, grade six, and grade nine. Data will need to be collected relative to the re-engagement of our students as well as the return of staff to our school buildings. I want to make it clear that the safety of our students and staff remain the top priority. So at this time, I will say we will entertain any questions. Ms. Ms. Carlson. Mark, Dr. Williams, um, I have a couple of comments and, um, and just actually two questions. Um, as you know, we have received massive amounts of feedback from parents via email, um, messaging. I have spent literally hours on the phone speaking to parents, and what I'm hearing is, and you just provided a little bit of what I'm hearing is that parents need more information, a level of specificity so that they know what they need to do as far as babysitting, as far as their jobs. Um, but people are asking questions like, what is the remote learning going to look like? How many hours? Will there be graded assignments? Um, is attendance going to be required? Will students get comments on their assignments like essays? Um, those type of things. And But that leads into, um, in a recently released paper, the Mayo Clinic estimated that 70% of the U.S. population, which equates to about 200 million people, would have, have, would have to have recovered from COVID to even halt the epidemic. So my question is, given what people need to make decisions about their families, if there is never a vaccine and we do not reach herd immunity for years, can we sustain remote learning while ensuring that there is true academic achievement? So I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and take a stab at that. Thank you, Ms. Mack, for that question. Um, you know, the team and I are very proud of what we stood up in 10 days in the spring. However, um, always wanting to be better. We know it was very much imperfect and that was an emergency situation and we were in a state of emergency called by Governor Hogan. And so what we have been doing throughout the spring is 
teachers, parents, students have been emailing us. I get some of those emails directly as, the, as do Dr. McComas and Ms. Shea. Um, and in addition, Ms. Shea and I, um, Mr. Burke and I, and Dr. Wistead and I have been meeting with TABCO leadership throughout the spring. We had weekly meetings with TABCO and sometimes uh, meetings twice and three times a week to talk through all the different challenges around reopening. And so what I can tell you is um, based on that feedback, we believe that more structured opportunities that might more um, closely resemble a bell schedule will make more sense moving forward. Um, we certainly are standing up um, a subgroup on grading and reporting because we know that we in imp imp implemented a pass fail system in an emergency situation and that the fall situation with more planning allows us to do possibly do some things in a more traditional manner. Um, and so I would love to be sitting here tonight proposing a plan for your approval. However, um, just thinking about the timeline, we would have had to have made a decision about two and a half weeks ago. And during, and in two and a half weeks ago, what we were in fact doing is we were meeting with stakeholders and we had our survey open. And so to have had the plan ready at this moment would have required us to plan without um, full input from our community. And so we're in a situation where I can assure you that we're working with our teachers and our administrators and our parents and our students to understand how we can make uh, virtual learning more rigorous going forward in the fall um, so it can be more scheduled and things like that. Thank you. Thank and you. then I have Ms. one more comment and then I'm finished. Um, we may, I mean, I don't know what it's going to look like, but if we're not going to be using teachers who teach specials um, in that capacity, um, can we consider using like an all hands on deck type of approach to um, have a, a, a teacher who's teaching a class virtually have a support system of other teachers who may not be subject matter experts, who, but who through professional development could learn to assist that teacher so that we can give the most um, direct instruction to as many students as possible. And the other part of that is how do we best utilize our support staff like school nurses who might not be providing medical assistance to kids in the schoolhouse but have so much to offer. So that's the end of my questions. I've got a couple questions. So I, I'm sorry, this I, is I, Mr. Ms. Pasteur, excuse me, Ms. Ms. Pasteur is next, but I was waiting for staff to respond to Ms. Mack's questions. Yes, this is uh, Mr. This Burke. is Daryl Williams. Let me just respond. Ms. Mack and to the board, we are going to, we have looked at what we've done since March 16th. We have already talked about some enhancements. Uh, Dr. Adams spoke to it about synchronous learning. Um, so again, it's going to be all hands on deck because we don't know at this point the number of students, the number of staff we will have. So we will be flexible. And as you heard today, we have to have a variety of models because at any point, we may have to pivot like we did on March uh, 16th. And so, um, again, we're going to have all hands on deck to provide the support. Um, and again, the unions have been very collaborative with us, particularly as we went through the first closing and then what our plan would be for reopening. Thank you. Ms. Pasteur. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, Dr. Williams, no, first of all, I want to say um, uh, to Mr. Burke and Ms. Barnock, thank you very much for your presentation and to the staff for the work that you have been doing along this very arduous journey. Um, this is certainly not simple. Uh, so thank you so much for your work and to all the people who've been working on your committees and task forces as well, and you as well, um, Dr. Adams. Dr. Williams, um, I, I was happy to hear uh, your comments right at the end uh, because I can only imagine that if I'm 
a little turned around by the fact that tonight we, as a board, won't be trying to assist in narrowing it down or ordering um, this. And I do understand what Dr. Adams just said. Uh, he is correct that you would have had to have made a decision two weeks ago, and two weeks ago you were listening to people. But we have heard so many things from teachers. Um, so, Dr. Williams, uh, I was gratified in hearing you say that, and I want to make sure I didn't mishear you, that you're looking at a virtual opening. And I say that before you answer that I was gratified. Uh, can you put your picture up? I, I want to see what you look like as I'm talking. I want to see if you're making faces. <laughs> Thank you. Can you I see me? I, I see I'm not you. making a face. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I know how this virtual thing goes. Um, and before you answer that, and with my fear that you might say, no, Ms. Pastor, that's not what you heard, that clearly makes good sense to me to start off virtually. It's easier to move people into the buildings than it is to put them in the buildings and then have to pull them out. Um, the larger structure uh, certainly, I think, um, I think works well. So is that what I heard you say, that that's what's in your head, that we would start yeah. virtually? Yes. So I, I did say, after I kind of ramble for a minute or two, I did end by saying, I am leaning towards a virtual return. Here is my concern um, is that kids are making the transitions to new levels, kids who've been disengaged for a variety of reasons. They got to be some kind of phase in approach. Um, and so I, I think, and you heard all the information that uh, Ms. Bernard and Dr. Adams shared about just how to do the hybrid model. I think that was scenario two, and then um, the return to normal, if you will. I think at this point, based on everything that I've been reading, my conversations with my colleagues across Maryland, um, it may serve us better to lean towards a more virtual return. Understanding what we did during the initial closing won't be how we will start because of that feedback but to have some kind of phase in. I think our young folks may need that. I'm not quite sure when, when that will look, uh, what, when that will take place and what that will look like, but I just worry as a former principal, those transitional years, I worry about that as well as those kids who have been disengaged. And I agree. Um, also, as, as, as a former principal, I agree with you wholeheartedly that those in those transitional grades um, must not miss that, and, and you can't just throw them in the water and um, or without some supports, especially our babies. But we also have to consider what is fair and equitable for all of our teachers. Um, so that is something that you have to plan. I'm wondering, I know I'm the what and not the how, and I always say that, but I am wondering that how part of me is still, is still there and alive and well. So for those where it can happen, I'm wondering if you're thinking about um, semesters uh, for those students, that, and, and particularly in, in the upper grades, uh, the high school, um, as you're laying out the work so that the students can have more intense opportunities, which is pretty much like what, um, as one person who wrote a letter um, made it akin, she used the example of Hereford High School. But I, I know that other high schools do the same with that four-period day, because that means then you can rethink how many children, especially if you're doing virtual, how many children a teacher is addressing because now they're not all in a classroom together. And so you could probably do like a 
double class because the students are home. But my final point on this is that, uh, and it was just said, I think Ms. Mack um, stated it, parents need to know, and I guess I'm just taken aback just th that we have more time that's going to be spent in the planning. Parents truly need to know if we're going to do virtual, they need to know that, as Mr. Ad Dr. Adams pointed out two weeks ago. So, you know, we have to, we, we have to, we're running now because they need to know so that they can make their plans, even if they have older children, um, but children, they don't want to stay in the house by themselves all day. They have to go to work. Those children who uh, don't have the Wi-Fi or didn't have it, their parents need to be making some plans for them. The difference now is that there might well be more places for those children to go to get online. But still, those parents need to know. My fear is this, that you have to turn in a plan by August 14th. So we're talking a month now. But unless I'm a little calendar challenged, and I might well be, we meet as a board after that time. Is that correct? Do we meet after the 14th? Uh, Ms. We meet, sure, we we meet, meet on, on August 11th. August the 11th. So we meet. So uh, thank you. So on August the 11th, we will hear all that's been done. And I would like to hear as well, very honestly, because now you're talking a very short window, when teachers are going to get staff development, because there's a difference in getting staff development to do what was done in the spring and getting staff development to do what we're going to ask them to do virtually or hybrid or whatever, because they're going to really have to know how to develop lessons that they can use that will reach to children over a screen. They will have to know how to take their children into breakout sessions. All of those things going on to make that as real because time is up for us doing the best we can under the circumstances. And I put that in quotation marks. These children now need to have real instruction. That means all staff members have to be given that kind of staff development. And it is July the 14th. So, and that has to happen before school opens. But I would like you to think about that whole semester um, process and and so many other things, but I know those things will take place. Thank you. Dr. Williams, do you want to respond quickly and then we'll go to, uh, we have um, other board members lined up to comment. Again, the the particulars, the team is looking at and, and um, we can have uh, a recommendation um, probably by the end of this month um, in terms of the what, the framework, and then filling in everything. And to your point, you know, our teachers are still on, um, they're not scheduled to come back. So we would have to look at our, our days, um, what we call I got my other term and other system in my head, what we call pre-service week, what we do with teachers before for, for kids come back. Right. Um, so, so again, you know, based on just today, listening and reading made me make my last comment about leaning towards a particular model so we can be prepared and ready to go um, after Labor Day, because to your point, we're going to need some time. The teachers going to need some time. They have had this experience, so they lived it just like our kids. But to your point, we want to communicate um, as quickly as possible, so um, we can finalize our communication and our plan, and then build it out. Um, the team has been very good about working under 
kind of like uh, last minute. But I don't, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to think that we're just pulling this together. Um, but to your point, we can make a recommendation um, by the end of this month. And again, I'm still leaning towards this virtual return with some kind of phase in. Um, you mentioned the four by four. Um, that has been brought to my attention. I think that needs a lot of PD around that. Um, I don't personally, as a as a former principal and educator, to do that is different than the AB schedule. Um, and so I'm not close to that. I think we're going to have to study a little bit around this work. Oh, I um, mean a AB schedule. Oh, with okay. It. Oh, without okay. question, they would lose their minds. No, I mean, <laughs> that's where I'm going. Uh, a, oh. B schedule with that. That's the only way you can get them in some courses through a year during one semester. It, 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 it Yes. Yes. So, so again, we can, um, I don't want to delay this, but we can look at making some recommendations sooner than later because, um, and again, it's 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 a little contrary to where the state is. The state is since we're in phase two, the recommendation from MSDE is talking to uh, speaking around the scenario two, I believe, what Dr. Adams presented about, you know, reduced load. But I, I just think based on where we are as a system, based on our numbers, um, and based on trying to do this right, I'm still leaning towards a, a virtual return. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And I will say that uh, we do have a board meeting scheduled August 11th, but given the pandemic and given other things that are going on, if we need to uh, place a special meeting, then that's something that um, can be considered. Um, I know I have several people that are have their hands raised patiently, and what I have is Mr. Muhamza then Ms. Rowe, and then um, Ms. Hen, and then Mr. McMillian. So, Mr. Mahamza? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, too, reiterate uh, some of the sentiments concerning our teachers and understanding um, their concerns and listening to them. Uh, but my question, I have actually two questions. It's concerning a group of students that we usually don't hear much from, and that is our students with special needs and learning disabilities and so uh, uh, I didn't uh, I believe a parent a couple parents uh, a couple weeks ago were, uh, were raising issues concerning IEPs and um, other programs that might have been affected because of virtual learning could you guys could you elaborate on that uh, because I was unaware Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mahomes. Hi, Josh. Um, I can't wait to meet you in person, by the way. I'm a big, I'm a huge fan already following you on social media. Um, given um, whenever there's a pandemic, the U.S. Department of Ed and then the State Department and our state put out guidance for what is allowable and what is okay for our students with disabilities to receive what's, what we call FAPE, which is their free appropriate public education. And so, Given um, our current situation, it is not that BCPS is withholding any services. It is that the pandemic is making it either very challenging or impossible to deliver a service. And so one of the first things that happened in the spring is we, had, we asked our special education teachers and our special ed teams, they were required to contact each family of a student um, with a disability and speak to the parent or guardian or decision maker about what might be possible. For example, it might be possible for me to do small group tutoring with you across the computer on a Microsoft Teams. It is not possible if I'm a physical therapist for me to manipulate your body because we're not physically together. And so we then had to reach agreement during the pandemic with families. And when there was an agreement, there are legal steps that go into place in terms of a family can say they're in disagreement with what the school system is proposing. Um, and then we can follow up with IEP team meetings and hold those um, as, as possible. And we did have IEP team meetings ongoing during the spring. Those were also held, as you can imagine, virtually and not in person. And so there is um, the unfortunate 
uh, side effect of the pandemic across our nation does mean that some services that would have ordinarily been provided cannot be provided if we are not together in the same space. At the same time, um, our Assistant State Superintendent of Special Education mm -hmm. has been assuring Dr. Wistead um, that tell schools they're not doing anything wrong, they have to reach agreement. You know, this isn't sort of like Dr. Adams, I was a special educator. It isn't me not wanting to do, it's what can I do and what is reasonable. And so um, the guidance from the State Department of Ed is as we return to school, and then once we're fully back in school, then when we're in place and we can do assessments, we determine um, where is the student functioning, what part of their current performance is because of services that weren't able to be provided, and then what can we provide now that we're all back together to make up for that lost time. And so that's sort of the structure and the framework that has been outlined for us by the State Department of Education following USDE guidance. Okay, thank you. And my second question was um, concerning the protocols of screening uh, when students are entering the building. And also, it's kind of it's similar to that. Uh, I was I, I asked you this question, uh, I, I believe two months ago when we had this meeting with students about um, what if a student decides uh, to come to school not wearing a mask or not uh, adhering to some of the requirements that you guys set forth if we're in like a strict um, social distancing reopening. Um, do you have an answer to that? And also my first question. Sure, um, thank you for that. And so um, our Office of Health Services is acquiring personal protective equipment in the event that um, the eventuality that we may be in spaces together, adults and children, um, and they would still be required. And so, for example, um, we would, um, in our thinking, we could, if masks were required at that point in time, beginning with being on the bus, we could have extra masks available on the bus in case someone um, did not, let's just say on the nice side, does not show up with it because I forgot it. Um, additionally, our Department of School Safety is working with a group to think about what are the protocols and steps that we would put in place um, in order to work with and work through students who may choose to not follow an established rule like all people in the building need to have a mask on. Those have not been finalized yet, but that is being worked on. Um, I can speak for our Office of Health Services around screening procedures. Um, and to try to do my best Deb Somerville imitation. Um, temperature checks have found to be not quite effective in student in determining whether students are sick or not. Um, what the data are telling us is that um, young individuals, children don't necessarily show as having a fever like adults do. Um, the other thing that Ms. Somerville has taught me, I don't go anywhere without her these days, is that the quick temperature thermometers that you could use are very sensitive to whatever the temperature is outside. So when it's extremely hot outside or extremely cold outside, you actually need to wait up to 10 or 15 minutes before you take someone's temperature who's been in the elements in order to get a fair reading. And so my understanding is that Ms. Somerville and her team have created a variety of mitigation strategies that may not include um, temperature checks for children may include adults doing temperature screening before they would be um, coming into a building, but would in their totality, and I'm sorry, I can't rattle them all off for you at the moment, um, provide us with the safest environment that we can ensure for staff and our students if we were back in the buildings together. You're muted. Okay. Uh, my last one really quick. Um, it's concerning uh, the success of the virtual learning. Um, I know there's there were concerns and some students said they were not able to study adequately. But what is the data telling us? Uh, was it successful? Um, what what were you guys seeing from um, this uh, experience? Well, what I will say is the data are mixed. Um, we heard from many parents and students who were pleased with what happened in the spring. Uh, we heard, that was about a third. 
we got a third feedback that said what we were doing and what teachers was, were doing was not quite enough and they wanted more, um, which is about a third. And then we heard from many students and families from more impacted areas who were saying, whoa, this is way too much. You know, I'm living with a sick relative or my part-time job at Home Depot has become a full-time job because I'm considered essential and I just can't keep up. So I cannot tell, I cannot sit here and say, whoa, was a raving success because really results have been mixed based on people's experience and impact and the impact of the virus um, in their proximity and their circles. So our efforts and planning for the fall are really about how could we mimic one of the ideas we have as a team is how could we best mimic um, in school structures around bell schedules and times and check-ins with teachers that would be more akin to um, a traditional bell schedule, even if we aren't physically in the building. Because we saw that when some schools were able to add that kind of structure, sometimes their students did a little bit better. Okay. Thank you so much. And next we have Mr. Rod McMillian. Great, good. You had me further along the list. Okay, here's my two questions, Dr. Adams. Uh, in phase two, in the tan box at the top, it says persons at high risk encouraged to continue to observe safer at home precautions. What kind of accommodations are you providing for teachers, uh, any staff members, and students that are at an, in a higher risk category? Mr. McMillian, this is Mr. Burke. I'll answer that question for Dr. Adams. Uh, right now, um, there are leaves available for uh, teachers and staff members that have conditions that wouldn't make it possible for them to uh, return when it's deemed that it's safe to do that. And we'll have to go by that guidance. Um, uh, there are no specific plans in place yet around those accommodations, but people that require them would certainly be able to request them. And then there are, there are certain leaves, COVID leaves, that are available uh, for people that are impacted and, and are at high risk. And so those employees would work with the Office of Human Resources to determine what leaves are appropriate and available, uh, and, and we would work through those structures. Okay, and secondly, my, my last question, and Dr. Berger, or, or Mr. Burke or Dr. Adams, whoever. It seems to me that, let me get my thoughts together here. Has, how much time has been given to looking at a phase where the families and the staff have the opportunity to make the decision whether they come back or they don't come back? Uh, and, and I understand that you know the logistical piece of that would be a, an absolute nightmare. However, it would give, if the sooner we implemented something like that, the sooner we could start figuring out the process. So how much time was given to something like that? So if a teacher has, has uh, is, is at high risk, the teacher decides, I would prefer to do virtual rather than come in. If a family wants to go virtual, they go virtual. If not, then they, they attend school. How much time was given to that, that scenario? Thank you for that question, Mr. McMillian. Um, to begin, I want to stress that we haven't made any firm decisions yet. And so to your to your point, we have been paying attention to other reopening plans that have opened around the county, you know, Miami-Dade, Broward County in Florida, Loudoun County and Fairfax County in Virginia, um, New York City, LA, um, San Diego and others. And so we have been discussing what it might look like. I'll speak around families what it might look like for families to opt in or out of being in the building or not. Um, and, but as you just mentioned, that's only a piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle is, do we have staff, um, will staff be comfortable in the buildings? Do we have a large enough proportion of staff who would request leave, which would thereby make operating a building as a principal not really possible and not really safe? Uh, and so we're, we have and are currently discussing all of those types of options in terms of families having choice. Um, Mr. Burke really talked about um, staff having um, the ability to access that leave. Um, and I would have to leave the staff questions to either he or Chief Lowry if um, there was some more information that they could provide. Thank you very much.
Hi, this is Russ Kuhn. Actually, Russ, excuse me, um, Lily was next. I was just waiting. Was staff going to respond to Mr. McMillian's last question, or is that something that you'll staff will get back? I think we need to get back, Mrs. Causey. This is Mr. Burke. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, Ms. Rowe, if you still had a question, and then Mr. Kuhn. Yes, I do. So, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that we have this phase one and two, one, two, and three plans, but that the answers to the questions that I'm hearing seem like there's a lot of feasibility issues with the phase two plan. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, am I hearing that because of that, the school system is leaning more towards remaining digital? even during phase two until or even if we can work out the feasibility issues with the phase two plan. Is, is that a proper understanding? This is Mr. Burke again. Yes, Ms. Rowe, I believe that is a proper understanding. It's impossible to know some answers at this point, even the data around what students or teachers will return. And so starting virtually gives us an opportunity to continue to assess those conditions as well as the community spread conditions. Okay, so the next question I have is, if we were to return students to um, the school building at a time where there were still infection rates, how, how do we protect student medical privacy at the same time we do contact tracing? So, for instance, if someone in the building were to get um, tested positive for COVID-19, then the contract tracing would suggest that we should notify other people in contact with that person that they've been in contact with someone. And, I and we have health-related privacy information. And so I'm, I'm wondering what protocols are being put in place to do contact tracing in a way that also protects privacy. So our Office of Health Services um, is in daily contact with the Baltimore County Health Department and Dr. Branch, who's our chief um, medical officer, and Ms. Somerville and her team under the leadership of Dr. Nieves and Dr. Zarchin um, have created protocols, and that would all be handled through um, the Health Services Office and the Department of Health and wouldn't necessarily be handled through a principal or a teacher in terms of um, contacting other adults and or children who've likely been in close contact with a, a student or an individual who's tested positive for COVID-19. Okay, and for individuals who are at risk for COVID-19 complications, does that include, does, does the student or teacher have to be at risk or does that include that maybe a student's primary caretaker is a grandparent and that grandparent's at risk. Do we then have the student come to school or does the student stay home and virtual learn? So Ms. Uh, Rowe, those are good questions. That's when we collaborate with our health department. We look at every situation. And so those scenarios would be discussed uh, with the health um, officials with our nurses. Um, I, I don't know if Dr. Adams is able to respond to that. That's more on the health side and school safety. So I do know that these contacts will happen um, with the collaboration of our um, medical professionals in terms of what we do and next steps okay. if there are cases. So one of the things that I know was a big concern is the number of students who um, we just weren't really in contact with, but they weren't engaged with the digital learning. And if we stay in a digital learning environment, has there been any thought to bringing those students who for whatever reason, they absolutely just can't do digital learning back into the buildings under social distancing while allowing the rest of the school system to be in digital learning as a potential alternative to phase two. So there were some discussion as I shared about a phase in um, to your point. Yes, there's some students 
who may not be able to do the digital learning or other circumstances. Um, but again, we're looking at the safety first um, as we collaborate with Dr. Branch and his team, Deb Somerville. Um, so we, we're gonna have to, that's what the point about phasing in and what that may look like once we have open. Okay, so that just leads to my final question, which is with the digital learning that we did in the spring, there was an intention to keep some of the material, I don't want to say limited in rigor, but for be lack of a better way of putting it, not academically overwhelming because we didn't want students who were being impacted by the pandemic to fall so further behind students who weren't that we have this huge gap between the two. And I'm wondering, will that continue? And what does that mean if this goes on indefinitely or for a whole school year for students who are college bound and need to reach a certain level of academic achievement? So the vision is to kind of mirror a somewhat typical day. Um, again, we, we've learned um, some lessons around the asynchronous. So there's going to, we're going to look more at a different model. Um, but to your point about college ready, you know, we still collaborate with our neighbors um, working with CCBC and the local universities, Towson, um, Coppin, Morgan State, et cetera. You know, I think that's the, that's the beauty of the collaboration to hear what they're doing. And then we've been asking, superintendents been asking about just the admissions process. And I, I think they have relaxed some of those um, assessments or entrance um, so interest exams. So I, I think this is the ongoing conversation that we'll have, uh, particularly as our kids are graduating. So um, we don't have all the answers yet, but I do know what we did back in the spring and how we will start will be different in some regards, just to make sh to try have some kind of um, resemblance of a typical schedule. Um, but again, we, we still got to work with our staff and students who have underlying health issues who may not be able uh, to participate. We got to think about how we support them. And, and, and so that's the work. So I appreciate your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I believe Russ is next. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I have, Dr. Williams, for you and your team is to understand if you have looked at the, um, the ability to differentiate. Uh, so for example, would you allow, for instance, elementary schools or certain grades in elementary schools to actually go back to school, whereas middle and high school could have different outcomes or different um, <clears throat> different ways of, of approaching education. Is that something that has been, um, is that a possibility, I guess, is one of my questions or something that, that you've looked at? Sure, it's a possibility. It gets to the phase-in approach. Um, one may think that our secondary school students may um, be well-versed to be able to immediately do some virtual learning um, sometimes our younger students may need additional support. So I, I mentioned that in, in kind of my comments when I talked about the phase and approach um, and I highlighted the transitional years. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about those students who are entering middle and high school for the first time, but I think we can look at that and figure out um, how to phase that in and of course, we will still collaborate with MSDE around some guidance. Um, so, yes. Thank you. Um, just to follow on, um, is it appropriate, especially with pre-K and K through two, 
to to try and teach remotely? Is it an appropriate way to interact and and teach those children? I know we have no, you know, we, we had no option before, um, but I, I'm just trying to understand the appropriateness of of those age groups and educate them in a remote environment. So is it appropriate? Yeah. I was going to say, I'm Dr. Sorry. Williams, this is uh, Dr. McComas. I'll, I'll take this one, Dr. Williams, if well, I didn't mean to let me, let, me, let me just finish, Dr. McComas. Yes, let me, sir. Let me, just, let me just say this. Um, there's a lot of research around that. Um, I just want to overemphasize we're looking at safety first as a driving factor. Um, and and Good so, Jesus. you know, I, I just want to just go there that safety is important and i know dr mccombs can uh, speak specifically around the younger ages yes sir thank you dr williams i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off a few moments ago um so thank you mr coon i know we all have great um investment in our youngest learners and the urgency of in-person and direct teaching with our youngest students and so your question around developmental appropriateness is a great one um, and what I would ask us all to keep in mind that all of us agree that our students thrive most when they are in the direct care of experienced and certified professionals who are able to work with them face to face um, is always the optimal um, context, especially for our youngest learners. And then, of course, that can be supplemented by lots of different resources, um, you know, materials as well as um, forms of digital um, resources. As we all know, our experience this past May, uh, excuse me, this past March with the pandemic really forced our hand to like move in a direction that was um, not the direction that we were working towards. And so I think really what's critical is we move forward into this unfolding scenario of this upcoming year um, is that we understand that the quality of whatever is happening, rather that's um, in person or remote is as approximate as we can to in person. So what I mean by that is really helping everyone understand uh, the development between um, asynchronous, which is what we did in the emergency situation last year when we had little time to prepare, and moving more towards a synchronous or live instruction where teachers are actually working more um, in person and in real time with students. And I think that would be more beneficial for our youngest learners. Um, and so, Mr. Kuhn, I offer that up to say, by all means, we all prefer our youngest learners working in person um, as sort of the optimal approach. Um, but given confounding situations, and of course, as Dr. Williams said, um, safety is our number one priority, we are looking to um, enhance and develop our uh, synchronous teaching practice, which would give our students more direct in-person uh, live engagement with our professionals in a way that um, we were not able to scale up that quickly in the time frame that we had last year. So I appreciate your question. I just offer that is a complex response um, and that we have to um, essentially evolve our practice uh, to synchronous instruction. That would be more appropriate uh, than just an asynchronous model if we're forced to do remote learning with our youngest children. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Thank you. And a few more, a few more items I'd like to talk about, Dr. Okay, uh, Dr. go Williams. ahead, Russ, and then I'll speak after you. Um, I just wanted to to make a comment, and I, I fully understand we don't have all the answers here, and this is extremely challenging. Um, I do um, appreciate the work that's been done and the presentation that was shared. And I want to thank everyone for that. Uh, one of the things that I think we need to be cognizant of is <clears throat> that parents have to make decisions and that we need to give parents options. And uh, Dr. Williams, you've all but said that we're going to, you're, you're leaning very strongly towards a remote digital uh, entry plan. Um, but one of my, one of my, I guess, comments would be that we should provide a full remote option regardless of what what we decide uh, ongoing so that um, so that parents and students that have extenuating circumstances could take advantage of that and meet them at that point 
So I just wanted to um, to share that. I know this is a challenging time, and there's um, a lot of conflicting information out there. Uh, so I, again, um, I just want to make sure that we, we are focused on that and we make sure that they are um, really part of this calculation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Kuhn, for that. Thank you. And um, board members and staff and communities, we are uh, running quite behind and we apologize that we had some earlier delays. Um, so I'll be brief and um, Dr. Williams and, and uh, uh, Dr. Adams, we don't necessarily need any answers. I just wanted to make some points and I appreciate the board's um, comments and all of the discussion that we've had thus far because this is mission critical for our families and our staff. Um, I just wanted to make the points that what we have heard um, related to the um, continuity of learning that we had in the spring, which was an emergency, um, that there were um, concerns and, and going forward and just that the Board of Education is committed to maintaining rigorous performance and achievement standards for all students and providing a consistent and fair process for evaluating, grading, and reporting student progress that is understandable to students and their parents. So that we're um, hopeful that, as Dr. Williams had mentioned, that there's um, going to be more rigor and um, more <clears throat> process around that. Um, the other issue involves in attendance, and the Board of Education recognizes that students are required to be enrolled in school and attending or participating in school-related activity each day that school is in session, and the Board believes that regular attendance is paramount in ensuring that all students will graduate from high school and become responsible, lifelong learners and productive citizens. So we are um, hearing a lot of concerns, especially around parents understanding when their child is engaged in their in their Google Meet classes. Um, and so putting in those parameters where parents can check on the engagement of their children to make sure that they're really um, taking advantage of everything that's available. The other um, comment I wanted to make was around the um, semester scheduling and Ms. Pasteur uh, made some comments around that and the board had received emails. And I just wanted to point out that um, it had been sent around around Howard County um, that their board authorized um, at the superintendent's recommendation having semester classes for this year, um, specifically in terms of coping well with the with the reentry plan in the midst of the pandemic. And basically, what that does is it allows students to only focus on four courses during the week and only having four cohorts of students, either that they're engaged with digitally, or if we do a phase in, um, that then they're in physical contact in the buildings. The other thing that it does is it reduces the teacher workload from six courses per week to three courses per week and only three cohorts per week. So while it does take a different scheduling process, we did implement new um, scheduling software. So hopefully that would be something that would be considered in terms of when we are trying to do something that is difficult and new and challenging in, in many ways in the midst of our circumstances, that this in fact may be something that is helpful to teachers and students and families in order to um, allow the children to have physical health, social and emotional health and also um, academic achievement. The only other thing I wanted to ask uh, the superintendent um, is that we had discussed um, about policies that um, may need to be uh, amended or implemented differently um, in the continuation of virtual learning, um, no matter how we uh, use that in the fall. So I would just ask that those be considered and then when um, additional recommendations are brought forward to the board, that there would be a greater understanding around uh, policies. Um, and I will leave it at that. Um, so if there's no other board comments, I didn't see any other hands, we can move on to the next agenda item, which is unfinished business, new strategic plan. And for that, uh, we call on Dr. Williams and Dr. Wheatley Phillips. Ms. Causey? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, we added an agenda item for Mr. McMillian regarding uh, board meeting. 
Yes, we did. Thank you very much for that reminder. And um, did we also add a five minute limit? That's what was voted on. Okay, thank you. So Mr. McMillian, I will give you the floor for um, your agenda item and then uh, for whatever comments by superintendent or um, staff or other board members. I've already said it, but you know, the public, in my opinion, the public needs the opportunity to be heard. And if we're talking about opening up schools, which we are, uh, and we're talking 175 schools to open up uh, in some of the phases, then I think that we're capable of opening up, uh, you know, Greenwood is too small, which it could very well be. Some of our high school auditoriums out of 24 high schools, some of our auditoriums hold 800 to 1,000 people, maybe even a few more. But I'm not saying pack those places. I'm saying if, if 50 people can get in and the, and the Board of Education members are safely, socially distanced on stage and, and people are given the opportunity to, to attend, I, the public wants to be heard on this. And they've written emails, and I think a lot of them are just not satisfied with writing an email. They want to be, state what they want to state in front of the people. And I think if we can work that out, we, I personally think I have a responsibility to say what I'm saying for the constituents in my area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, I would ask um, Dr. Williams or other board members for comments or discussion. Ms. Palsy? Yes. This is Lily Rowe. So I think given what we just heard from the superintendent and his staff that we're looking at continuing a virtual opening, even in the fall, and that the state superintendent still has buildings and offices closed, I don't see how we can move forward on mandating that our next meeting be public um, without being out of compliance with the state superintendent and the superintendent's and staff's own recommendation, so I, I can't support this. Um, Mr. Offerman. This Mr. Offerman here? Yes, go ahead. I, I would like to offer an amendment that, that we take what Mr. Mamillion said, but but also add to it that uh, that 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 uh, such a meeting would happen only if uh, if if, uh, if if the state board uh, would 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 uh, state board would permit and the opening or the, the openings of buildings. Excuse me. Is there is it is there a second to that amendment? I second. Ms. Is there Cosby? a discussion around that amendment? Ms. Cosby, is there a motion on the floor? Mr. McMillian's agenda item, uh, he said, was a motion to have the next board meeting in person in a high school. Is that okay, correct? I, I'm sorry, I did not hear that when, when the uh, agenda item started. Thank you. Mr. McMillian, is that correct? I talked about it earlier trying to get on the agenda. I didn't specifically say a motion at the start of this conversation here four or five minutes ago, but I can. Well, so we want to uh, spend this time with the agenda item that you set. If you would like to make a specific motion, then why don't you do that now and we can uh, then process that. I move that our next Board of Education meeting be held live. If Greenwood is unavailable, then I move that we use one of the 24 high schools auditorium. And I'll add and contention upon the state superintendent opening up schools. Thank you. So Mr. that's a motion. Mr. 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 Thank you. Second. 
Okay, and so uh, Ms. Hag Dr. Hager, did you have uh, comments or questions? I was going to propose a similar amendment based on both the school reopening, but also the number of people allowed by the state or county in a specific area at a time, so limited, limited to that number. Okay, and I would also remind um, the board and our community that at our regular in-person meetings, we would only have 10 speakers at a time. So um, that would be one factor to consider. The other issue is um, Dr. Williams, I believe had said that we could consider having a in-person board meeting, but clo closed to the public initially. Um, and that I believe would be appropriate under essential personnel being allowed in buildings, even if we're not allowed to have the public in meetings as a way of um, our own reentry plan into uh, more in-person activities. Uh, but that's just a, a, a thought that I have. It's not an, a, an amendment, it's just my comments. I have some comments, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. I see Ms. Scott has minutes. her hand up. Ms. Ms. Causey, our five minute yes. discussion was up. Okay. Uh, yes, this is Ms. Scott. I had my hand up. I just wanted to know if the before we vote on it, if the um, uh, Rod's motion could be repeated, just so that we're clear, because it's been quite a bit of conversation. Okay, thank you, Rod. If you can um, repeat your motion, and then we're going to take a vote on it. I'm curious what Ms. Gover wrote down. Maybe she can read it. Ms. Gover, did you write that down? My apologies. Uh, Mr. McMillian moved um, that the next Board of Education meeting be held live if Greenwood was unavailable to use one of the 24 high schools auditorium, all contingent upon the state superintendent opening up schools. Ms. Hager also um, amended it to include only allowing the, limiting the number of people allowed per the state guidelines. So is that an event, Ms. Hager? So as I understand it, that would mean that we would have a, a meeting in person at an auditorium only contingent upon the guidelines from the state superintendent. Is that what you intended, Rod? Yeah, if she opens up school buildings, yeah, then we could go. A, a court, you know, socially distance and do it, take temperatures and everything associated with it. But if she doesn't, then then we would continue meeting virtually. Correct. All right. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I have a question. Um, Mr. Mahomes, I had some hands that were raised, and we are uh, beyond our time <clears throat> in more ways than one. So. Uh, I'm just going to have a 30 second comment from those that raise their hands, which is Ms. Pasteur, Ms. Hen, and then Mr. Mohamza, and then we're going to uh, take a vote on the motion. What I thank you, Ms. Pauzy. What I just heard. Voted to suspend rules. Excuse Point me. Point of order. We voted to suspend rules and limit debate to five minutes. The five minutes was up a minute and a half ago. So okay. we need to call the vote. Okay. Uh, Mr. Um, McMillian just threw something softly under his breath about temperatures, et cetera. There is nothing in this, whether the state superintendent amends, changes, or whatever, um, about safeguarding those people who have existing conditions. Um, I won't be there unless you, you tell me all of the things that are going to be done have been done in that facility to clean it, sanitize it, and how all of us and everyone else comes in will be medically checked. That's a piece that was left out, and it's a critical piece. And Madam Chair, I was, my question was asking, um, are we including uh, Dr. Hager's uh, recommendation in this vote, eliminating the number of people? Before you take a vote, that's why I was wanting to ask. Uh, that was not made as an amendment. Okay. So, 
but but understand that the um, arrangement of the facilities and the staff that holds the meeting is uh, Dr. Williams' staff and managing how the facilities happen. So they would be instituting the protocols that would be um, appropriate at that time. So, um, okay. So we're going to uh, have the vote. Ms. Scover, if you could do a roll call vote, please. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Abstain. Ms. Hen? No, because I didn't get a chance to speak or ask questions or clarify. Ms. Causey? Uh, no. Ms. Jost is um, absent. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Ms. Rowe? No. The motion fails. Thank you, board members. And um, just know that the board officers and the superintendent will be in ongoing conversations about how the board can have its own reentry plan. Okay, so thank you. Um, and moving on to the unfinished business, item M, the new strategic plan. And for that, we have uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. Wheatley Phillips. All right, so good evening, everyone, again. Uh, during the June 9th Board of Education meeting, members of DRAW, uh, our three community superintendents, our chief academic officer, and one of our own principals, actually the principal of the year, Ms. Kelly O'Connor from Mars Estate, and I presented the strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence. The strategic plan is organized in five focus areas, learning accountability and results, safe and supportive environment, high performing workforce, and alignment of human capital. The fourth one is community engagement and partnerships, and the last one is operational excellence. On June 23rd, I had the pleasure of sharing the highlights of the new strategic plan uh, during the principal's leadership development meeting and an overview of the alignment of the strategic plan with school progress plans and school improvement. That evening on June 23rd, the board had another opportunity to make comments and ask clarifying questions about the strategic plan. Tonight, I am seeking approval of the new strategic plan. Do I have a motion to approve the compass, our pathway to success, the new strategic plan for Baltimore County Public Schools? So moved, Lisa Mack. Thank second. you. Do I have a second? Second, Mamza. Thank you. Board members, is there any discussion? Hearing none and knowing that, uh, as Dr. Williams pointed out, there's been a number of discussions and a number of questions and answer sessions. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Ms. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Jost is absent, sorry. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Oh, that's very exciting. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, board members, if there is no dissent, I will uh, move that we um, move the report update on the multi-year improvement plan for all schools to the next board meeting. And that would lead us to that would lead us to item O, 
Report Community Eligibility Provision Program. And for that, we will ask Dr. Scriven, Mr. Pati P Mr. Patillo, uh, Dr. McGill Wilkinson, and Ms. Stansberry to come forward to present. So good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Superintendent Williams and board members. We have one adjustment and Ms. Woodstead, or excuse me, Dr. Woodstead. will be presenting in uh, lieu of uh, Ms. Stansberry. So just want to make that adjustment. All right, so tonight, uh, as you stated, I'm joined by Mr. Patillo, Dr. Whitstead, and Dr. McGill uh, Wilkerson. And we will be discussing uh, information on our CEP pilot program that was ran for the last four years at Dundalk High School, Dundalk Middle School, Hawthorne Elementary, and Riverview Elementary School. Uh, additionally, we will be doing a crosswalk between uh, CEP and our more traditional USDA uh, meal reimbursement program. And we will also uh, discuss uh, potential implications uh, if implementing CEP or continuing with that program on our Title I program. Uh, I understand that there's been some energy uh, definitely around us revisiting uh, CEP as an option. Uh, we are more than willing uh, to do that, but want to take this opportunity uh, to just merely present our findings um, in regard to the four-year program uh, that we just brought closure to at the four schools that I mentioned. Uh, so, Mr. Corns, you can go to the next slide, please. So, the child nutrition programs are federally funded and administered by the uh, United States Department of Ag Agriculture, USDA, and the Maryland State Department of Education, MSDE, and our program is the Food Service Enterprise Fund, uh, better known as FSCF. Uh, in that program, uh, it captures our costs of products um, for producing goods and services in order to set fees to recover the cost of meals, not just for students, but adults, and also a la carte foods. Um, the federal reimbursement from USDA are set annually uh, to cover meal serves, served to eligible students. And that is free reimbursement rates, reduced price reimbursement rates. And Jim, if you could slide up that last one that I can't see. That's why you always have a printout. It's all right. And pay re reimbursement rates. And you can go to the next slide. All right, as it relates to uh, our revenue plan and, and how it works for paid eligible students for 2019-2020 prices, it's as uh, listed below. Uh, breakfast for elementary is 140, for secondary 155. Our lunch rate for elementary is 290, for secondary it's three dollars, and then you have the a la carte food sales. Uh, the a la carte food sales is revenue collected for food items other than those available as part of the reimbursement bill. And these include packaged snacks, ice cream, canned beverages, and bottled water. And this goes towards uh, really covering uh, our operational costs for the Office of Food and Nutrition. Uh, they are also responsible uh, for monitoring all fiscal activity and that 
our office produces a monthly profit loss report, which tracks our progress as we move through the year. Jim, you can go to the next slide. Uh, actually, uh, after Baltimore Care County Cares, uh, Charles Patillo will start uh, at this point. So, Mr. Patillo. Good evening. Uh, my name is Charles Patillo. I'm executive director for business services operations. And I'll spend a few minutes providing information on our Baltimore County Cares for Kids initiative. The Baltimore County Cares for Kids initiative was created and implemented in July 2018 as a way for us to provide school meals to students who fell within the reduced price category at no cost. Typically, a student who falls within the reduced price category, they would pay 30 cents for breakfast and 40 cents for lunch. This initiative was launched with the idea of taking early advantage of the upcoming Maryland Cares for Kids Act. The Maryland Cares for Kids initiative is a program in which MSDE would subsidize reduced price eligible students at 10 cents per meal starting in 2019-2020 and add 10 cents each year up to a maximum of 40 cents in school year 2022-2023. Next slide, please. Each year, MSD releases official student meal eligibility program numbers on October 31st for the year. Attached are the numbers that were released on October 31st, 2019. As you can see, eligibility is divided into three categories. You have free eligible, reduced price eligible, and paid eligible. Eligibility can be determined in two ways, one of which is direct certification and the other is benefit application. Examples of direct certification would be SNAP, I think most of us know it as food stamps. You have TANF, which stands for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. You have a person who is homeless. You could have a person who is a foster child, or you could have a migrant. Next slide, please. Here you see a graphic that shows the average daily participation of reduced price eligible students for the last three years. If you move your attention to the column labeled 2920, Baltimore County Public Schools had an average participation by reduced price students for breakfast of 3,411, which is a 32.8% change since 2017, 2018. And the increase for lunch and average daily participation is 21.2%, and that's up 925 students since 27, 2018. Next slide, please. Baltimore County Public Schools elected to implement Maryland Cares for Kids initiative one year early under the, under the Baltimore County Cares for Kids. In doing so, beginning in FY 2019, reduced price eligible students will receive breakfast and lunch at no cost. This chart represents the revenue that Baltimore County Public Schools did not collect from reduced price eligible students and the net revenue when subsidies are collected from the state. Next slide, please. Through the implementation of the Baltimore County Kids for Kids program, BCPS has seen an average daily participation for reduced price eligible students increase by 32.8% for breakfast and 21.2% for lunch. The increase has been realized with lessened fiscal impact in CEP. This program also prevents unintended consequences like avoiding in the individual student farms eligibility data changes in accountability reporting, changes in farms calculations and reporting, and negative impacts on academic programming. Finally, this program avoids funding the meals for students that are not eligible for farms and who would usually fall into a paid category. I will now turn over the presentation to Dr. McGill Wilkinson, who will discuss CEP. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. One more, please. Thanks. So the Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP, was introduced in the Child Nutrition Reauthorization of 2010, the Hun Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. It is a federal option for high poverty schools to offer breakfast and lunch at no charge to all students in the school without the need to collect meal benefit applications. Once a school chooses to adopt the CEP option, the provision continues for four years. Next slide, please. 
In accordance with the Baltimore County Council Resolution number 3216, BCPS implemented the Community Eligibility Pilot Program beginning in the 2016-2017 school year. This past year, 2019-2020, was the final year of the pilot. Due to the closing of schools, the pilot ran through mid-March of 2020. The council selected four schools to participate, Riverview and Hawthorne Elementary Schools and Dundalk Middle and High Schools. Quarterly reports to monitor progress were produced by the Division of Research, Accountability and Assessment and provided to the Baltimore County Council. The evaluation examined three areas, participation in terms of the average number of meals and the percentage of students participating, student behavior, including attendance and suspensions, and school climate as measured by the annual stakeholder survey. Next slide, please. As mentioned, one of the construct measured is participation and displayed on the slide are graphs depicting student participation for both breakfast and lunch. The data shown are the percentage of students receiving either breakfast or lunch. Since student enrollment can fluctuate throughout the year, this metric takes enrollment into account. Each graph shows baseline data along with three years of the program. For breakfast, there are two schools that increased participation in year one, with only one of those schools continuing to grow past year one, and two schools had a decrease in participation since baseline. For lunch, all schools had increased participation beginning in year one. Participation remained stable for three of the schools, and Dundalk High School had a slight decline in participation. Next slide, please. Overall, participation in the CEP breakfast program has been mixed over time. Participation rates have increased at two schools and decreased at the other two. While there have been increases in participation in the CEP lunch program across all four schools compared to baseline 2015-2016, participation has remained constant since year one, 2016-2017, in three of the schools and has decreased in one school. Over the three years of the program, there has been no association between CEP and student behavioral outcomes. Suspension and attendance rates have remained constant and school climate ratings have not systematically improved over time. And for the next slide, I will turn this back over to Dr. Scriven. So if we look at the uh, graph which is presented, it shows the impact in terms of cost to BCPS of the only school which has shown uh, any type of net gain has been R Riverview Elementary School. And Jim, if we go to the next slide, please. It actually breaks down uh, for you by school uh, what that financial impact has been on the system over the last four years. Uh, at those four respective schools. And as you can see, Riverview shows a net gain of 101,000, uh, but overall cost to the system has been slightly over $903,000. Uh, next slide, please. This is Melissa Wistead. Um, this slide shows you the many ways that Baltimore County Public Schools uses the free and reduced meal um, data. So supplemental resources become inaccessible for students who are not directly certified in CEP schools when the farms form is not collected. You see here we use uh, farms data for state assessments and the state enrollment files as well as school improvement planning and monitoring farms students as a category and when we don't have that information obviously that uh, what's being reported is inaccurate more specifically dual enrollment fees um, cannot be waived sat act advanced placement fees also cannot be waived there's college application fees as an opportunity as well as uh, fees for wireless access, which are no longer accessible for students because we don't have the 
free and reduced meal form to be able to show that the student would qualify for these waivers. We go to the next slide, please. If we continue with CEP, school poverty rankings and the Title I school level allocations will be dependent on fluctuating data from the different government assistance programs that were spoken about earlier, the TAN and the SNAP. One of the unintended consequences of the CEP program is the impact on the data used to allocate school level federal funds. The impact of the Title I allocations rests not only on the systematic level allocation, but it is really more about the specific school allocations that are given out. All the BCPS schools are ranked by school poverty level percentages determined using the farms data for the non-CEP schools and then the direct certification data for the CEP schools. An individual school's then qualify for their allocation of Title I funds based on those numbers of students through both the direct certification and the submitted free and reduced meal forms. CEP schools are not required to collect the forms, therefore the eligible Title I funds are solely based on the direct certification numbers. The sole use of the direct certification numbers results in an under identification of poverty which then reduces the Title I funds um, that the school is able to receive. So specifically, the federal regulations talk about that the CEP schools are not allowed to collect the free and reduced meal forms. Although permission to obtain socioeconomic data from children um, is allowed, farms form is typically what's used in many of the other districts to determine eligibility and um, is recognized for those waivers that I was speaking about in the previous slide. So in alignment with our commitment to mitigate the loss of the eligibility of those Title I funds for the CEP schools, we had to make some adjustments in the Title I allocations in both FY19 and FY20. We ended up raising per pupil allocation, so it wasn't as large of an impact in some of the schools. And we also offered a 0.5 resource teacher uh, centrally, it, again, to mitigate the fact that schools were losing, quote unquote, funds because their numbers were so much lower. Um, so even though those mitigation strategies were in place, remember the overall Title I allocation that we get is not different, but all of the other schools were impacted because we had to, in some cases, include additional schools because they were above the poverty ranking of the CEP schools, which had dropped um, in poverty. And then again, the funds get spread out more evenly, um, which is an unintended consequence because of the distribution of the funds. If we go to the next slide, it shows you specifically what um, Riverview Elementary as an example, how their numbers have dropped over time prior to being CEP. And then after being CEP, so you can see that prior to CEP, they were able to use the farms forms plus the direct certified forms to get their low income count. But afterwards, they only use the direct certified count and there's a formula for it, but the number is still lower. Um, and just to share another example, um, which is not a Title I school because it's Dundalk High School, but their Maryland State Department of Education report card shows that their farm percentages have dropped. Um, in 2015, they were listed at 76.2%. And since participating in CEP, that number's dropped in 2019 to 46.2%. So this is all just to illustrate how the fluctuations in data led to um, the instability of funding and the instability of offerings we're able to do with students because of not being able to collect the free and reduced meal forms. If we go to the next slide, I believe Charles is going to wrap us up here. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wistet. For the 2021 school year, currently 66 schools would be eligible for inclusion in this CEP program. 
This number includes four centers, Rosedale's, Catonsville, Metalwood, and Crossroads. CEP usually runs in a four-year cycle, so the cost estimate of $2.1 million per year would be projected to cost over $8 million in four years. CEP doesn't offer the opportunity for reimbursement or subsidy from federal, state, or local sources. Next slide, please. Here's a meal summary slide that was given during the audit presentation, and it lets you know what meals were served during the school year 1819. As we are still tallying up meals served during 1920, we did not include that information in this presentation. However, I can tell you that one frequently asked question is, how many mobile meals have we served since March 13th? And that number through July 10th is 1,607,000. 262 meals. Next slide. As you can see from the mission statement of the Office of Food and Nutrition Services, one of their primary goals is to provide healthy meals and snacks in a cost and effective manner. When looking at the cost involved, the unintended consequences of CEP and the fiscal uncertainty of the future, the Office of Food and Nutrition Services recommends not adding any schools at this time under the Community Eligibility Program. Uh, that concludes this presentation on behalf of Dr. Scriven, Dr. McGill Wilkinson, Dr. Wistead, and myself, we thank you. Thank you very much for that. And now I'll open it up to board members. And I see hands raised, so I'm not sure if Dr. Hager is first or Ms. Uh, Scott is first. Um, um, well, I, I have a comment, a question, and I do plan to make a motion, so I don't know if the other board members would prefer to go first. It's up, it's up to them. Makita, would you like question. to go first? Okay. Sure. It's no worries. Um, I have a question. I wanted to know first, the, it looks like it was a pilot program that was in the Dundalk area, and I wanted to know um, the, I guess, so the reasoning behind um, identifying those schools for the pilot program. That was uh, my first question. Mr. Patillo, you can go ahead and take that one, please. Sure, the, the county selected those schools. Was it based on the need or how were those schools selected? There was a mix. A couple of them were selected on need and a couple of them were selected on, they wanted to make sure they represented different parts of Baltimore County. Okay, all right. And then my other question was, um, you spoke to it, but I wanted to know with going with um, CEP, um, what sort of benefits, um, how did that compare to Title I? If, because it sounds like we're specifically talking about four schools, um, but if we were to expand that, because I saw a list where it's other schools that are eligible, if we go with CEP versus Title I, because that's what it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, what kinds of things w would we be, I guess, sort of missing out on or um, it, uh, just sort of expand on that? Let me know um, how that would work. So it's not CEP versus Title I, but I'll let Dr. Whitstead or Ms. Stansberry uh, go on a little more detail, detail around potential implications. Thank sure. you. Yeah. I was going to say, um, oh, Ms. Stansberry, if I may uh, interject for a moment. Oh, thank you, Dr. Wissett. So this is Dr. McComas. So um, Ms. Scott, I'd like to clarify. So it really is what we're looking at here is, is how do we, the intent of everything is to ensure that any student that is experiencing food insecurity has access, of course, to breakfast and lunch. Uh, through the county. And so what are our options for doing that? Um, CEP has been one strategy and we did pilot that. Another strategy has been our Baltimore County Cares for Kids program, uh, which dovetails into the Maryland uh, Cares for Kids. And that is another, another strategy to ensure that students that need access to food have access to food. And so that's really, I think, fundamentally the long-term question here. Um, um, and why the difference is, is that um, CEP opens up the food access for all students. So if you could go back to the slide where it shows students who are eligible, um, I think that that visual will help us in this discussion very quickly.
one more. There you go. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Scott, if you look at this, you'll see there's sort of, you can think about students uh, in terms of accessing the food um, in these three categories. We have students who, of course, are eligible for free food. Uh, we have students who are eligible to pay a much more reduced amount for their meals. And, of course, we have students who pay full price. CEP provides uh, food um, for all students in all three categories. The Maryland Cares for Kids and the Baltimore County Cares for Kids program really picks up the cost of the students in the middle category, the reduced price cost, because the free and um, eligible students are already covered. Um, and so uh, the Baltimore County Cares for Pro uh, Kids program, excuse me, um, covers the first two categories, but does not cover the paid category. That's really the critical difference between the two uh, programs. And that, that really speaks to the difference in the cost that uh, Mr. Patello um, had pointed out. I say one of the other things to consider is there's uh, many people, many advocates who um, point out the fact that there are students who may be in the paid category. And while they may not be eligible for a reduced price, they're just barely above that um, threshold. And so that tends to be one of the areas in which we have to look very closely. Um, so I hope, Ms. Scott, that I provide some clarity for that. And uh, thank you, Dr. Wistead and Ms. Stansberry for letting me kind of jump in. Um, and thank you, Dr. Scrivens. Yes, and you did. We, thank you very much for, um, for clarifying that. And we still need to elaborate on the piece with Title I. Sure, I can start with that and Ms. Stansbury can fill in. Um, really, the, the Title I part was um, an unintended consequence. So like that example we shared with Riverview, Riverview um, was traditionally one of our higher ranked schools as far as the poverty rating. Um, and that number dropped because we were no longer collecting the free and reduced meal forms. and basing it solely on the direct certification made their number lower. Our other example of Dundalk Middle, it dropped it so low that we had to add in additional schools that had higher poverty ratings, which again, um, it just spreads out the amount of money that we serve all the schools for. And it wasn't a true representation of the numbers of students that qualify. So um, it, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't take away from their Title I status because we kept lowering the rankings so that those stay in, but we had to add other schools in between, um, at which spread out the dollars amongst a larger number of schools, if that helps. That does, thank you. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Erin Hager. I'm sure I can go next. So um, thank you for your presentation tonight. I think most of you know I'm fairly well versed in the CEP program since I do study food insecurity and health promotion for kids. And so since CEP addresses both of these programs and or both of these issues and more, um, I do know a fair amount about the program. Um, I'm honestly disappointed that the team only shared information from our small underpowered very small pilot uh, for which the data was not compared to schools that were CEP eligible but not participating, which is really the way that we do this analysis with CEP is we look at the schools enrolled in CEP and then those that were eligible but not participating. And I know that the county has access to that data, but that's really the better way to look at this, even though, granted, it probably is underpowered since it was only four schools. And I have other issues with the pilot study design, but I think the more relevant data that we should be focusing on and discussing stems from the growing amount of, of national data that has come out of the CEP program. So it started in 2014, so it's a young program, but just recently there was a review paper published in the American Journal of Public Health, which is a great journal, um, that summarized a lot of different studies that have looked at CEP. And they had some really, really strong findings showing that CEP has strong evidence for increasing meal participation rates, promising evidence for benefits on weight outcomes, food insecurity, disciplinary referrals and on-time grade promotion, so all things outside of feeding kids, and mixed evidence on the impacts of test scores and attendance, meaning that there were some studies that showed positive findings, some had null findings, and so we just need more evidence because, again, it's a very young program. And also CEP is considered a solution for seeking to address unpaid meal debt and eliminating meal shaming and stigma that comes with pre and reduced price meals. So 
I think that the better evidence to look to is this kind of larger national evidence on the impact of CEP on students in schools. And in fact, I wrote down, uh, Dr. Williams said in the last uh, presentation about school opening that science should drive decision making. And I think that that's really what we need to look to. And I, although I appreciate that this pilot was done, there are better design studies out there that we can look to to look at the impact of CEP. And I just want to mention a few other um, studies that were mentioned in our public comments. So if people want to look in that in the uh, board docs, these are studies that were done in Maryland. And one of them found that students attending CEP schools were nearly three times less likely to be food insecure compared to those in CEP eligible but not participating schools. Another found that food service directors and cafeteria managers in CEP schools in Maryland reported that CEP made the school meal easier to administer, reduced stigma, and improved job satisfaction among the cafeteria staff, which are all really good things too. And, and the last study I'll mention, I could talk about studies all night long, um, is a recent study that was really well done, it used Maryland data from before CEP went into effect, carried it through, so for over a long span of time, longitudinally, and, and she looked at CEP participating schools compared to CEP eligible but not participating schools and found improved science test scores in elementary schools. And remember during that time, we changed the test around a bunch of times. Um, the one test we didn't change was a science test. And so she found improved test scores in science and decreased disciplinary referrals. And this is looking at Maryland as a whole, not just for Baltimore County schools. And so oh, I um, mentioned this because again, I think we need to look at the bigger body of science when we think about what CEP can do. And I do recognize that there's a financial cost. I honestly, from what I knew of the program, I thought of it as more of a cost neutral program. I've done some more research in the last week. And I do recognize that there's a financial cost. It can be based on a lot of different factors. And I've had, I can get in the weeds some other time about the different ways to modify the price tag. Cause there are, it's a very complex program and there are a lot of different ways to kind of think about the cost. But most school systems that participate feel that the cost is offset by these outcomes that we see in kids beyond just feeding them. Um, and I, my, that, was, that was my big comment. Um, and then I do want to mention that I am concerned about your slide 17, where you list all the Title I issues and, and I know the term unintended consequences kept being said. I don't know if you could bring that up, slide 17. So my question is, you know, this is based on the fact that we had four pilot schools in CEP and then the rest of the CEP eligible schools were not in CEP. And so all, a lot of those schools are also Title I schools. So when I checked, it looked like there are 66 CEP eligible schools and 63 Title I schools. And I assume there's a lot of overlap in that kind of Venn diagram. Um, so my question is, you know, Th these are these were unintended consequences, but only because we were doing it in such a small number of schools. If we were to implement CEP system wide, then we can decide how we allocate the Title I funds. And so then it's no longer an impact to just four schools. And instead we can do an apples to apples comparison across the district versus total apples to oranges, which is what happened with the four schools in the pilot, and which was why we saw these unintended consequences. So I don't know if you can comment on that. Hi, this is Ms. Stansberry. Good evening, everyone. I am the Title I Director, and so I just want to speak about how we allocate the Title I funds and come up with district-level poverty. Um, so right now, we use direct certification and farms applications in our non-CEP schools and direct certification um, with a 1.6 multiplier in our CEP schools. Um, there are other ways in which we can collect that data, and we can absolutely have some conversations about that. However, um, the part that I want to highlight for everyone is that the other options that are accessible to us for collecting low-income student count data for each of our schools would mean that we would be relying on an outside agency to create eligibility requirements and then use their eligibility requirements to make decisions about what poverty looks like in each of our school school communities. And one of the things I think that Dr. Wistit um, wanted to convey was that there's the potential of not accurately describing or accurately recording um, low income poverty percentages in our school communities if some of our families are not eligible for those outside agency programs 
and therefore not recorded in our numbers. So it's just something for us to think through that um, eligibility for SNAP, eligibility for Medicaid, eligibility for TANF are all decisions that are made outside of the scope of BCPS and um, those requirements can change at any time and we would then be dependent on whatever those eligibility requirements would be to make decisions about what poverty looks like in our school district in our school district and within our school community. So I just wanted to kind of share that and then I don't know Dr. Wisted if you want to talk a little bit about some of the other um, implications from slide 17. Well I the other thing that, you know, we've been in conversations about and we've noted is, um, you know, that some of our Title I schools, the, the families are very comfortable filling out the free and reduced meal forms, and some of those same families may not be comfortable accessing the resources, as Michelle was talking about, through government agencies. And again, we would not have a an accurate representation of the poverty level because we'd be relying on um, families going to those government agencies. And we believe through looking through the data and the patterns that um, we get a better response rate from families filling out the free and reduced meal form. So it's a self-reported income form versus ob objective data about Medicaid and SNAP and other eligibility. So. You know, there, there are a lot of arguments about what certainly the more reliable would be the more would be the government programs. And I get that there's a concern that you're missing some some kids. Um, I do want to point out, too, that if we were to enroll in in uh, CEP now that the farms rate that is recorded in June of 2020. Yeah, okay, sorry, I'm making sure I can be heard. Um, my general comments about uh, Title I, and I do have a motion. Uh, Ms. Caldi, should I wait for the others to comment first before I make a motion? Um, actually, it might be helpful to make a motion and then some, the conversation can guide it. Okay, um, so I move that BCPS fully implement CEP in all schools eligible for CEP as of June 30th, 2020 so that we meet the August 31st, 2020 CEP filing deadline. Second. Second, Lisa Second. Mack. Second. So Lisa, Lisa Mack raised it, <clears throat> beat everyone to the punch. Okay, if you can speak specifically to your motion and then we'll open it up for um, other board members' questions and comments. Sure, I just feel that the science is clear. Again, I, I'm a scientist, This is, and also this is in line with what I actually study. Um, the CEP is not just about feeding kids, but it's really addressing a lot of the concerns that our school system cares about, as outlined in the Compass that we just approved, including equity and closing the achievement gap. And I think that this program can really do a lot for our kids in Baltimore County. I do recognize that it will cost money, and I'm always reminded that the board is the what and the superintendent in the system are the how. So um, should, the, should the motion pass, you know, as, as we look to the how, that I hope that there is... Um, you know, momentum in the school system to really implement this program in, in a broad way. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Other board members, I see, let's see, Ms. Pasture has had her hand up for quite some time. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, staff members, for the presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Hager, thank you uh, for filling in some of the gaps and the holes for uh, some of us. I um, appreciate, I'm going to go back to Ms. Scott's comment or question about how the schools uh, were selected and then tie it to Dr. Hager's comments as well as some of the things we saw in the presentation um, um, about participation going down, et cetera. I found it interesting that Riverview, um, certainly an elementary school, um, was different from the middle and the high in, in terms of 
it uh, going up. And in all of my many, many years in Baltimore County, and working not only with wherever I taught or was the administrator, but the feeder schools, understanding that at that elementary level, uh, you see that greater participation for uh, many reasons, whatever the program happens to be. Uh, those of you who have teenagers, you know how things happen in terms of lunch as they start to get older. Now, I, I, I've been around for a long time, and so I'm real clear that it is an ongoing battle to get children to fill out those farms' forms. We, uh, as administrators, Mr. Scriven, you know this. Anyone who's been an administrator knows we try every trick in the book to get them to fill out the book, the forms without them feeling put upon. You leave them on desk, you tell every child to take a form home, whatever. Children do not like and will not respond. The older they get, the clearer they are about not wanting to fill out those forms. In addition to which anyone who's ever worked in a school where there is um, any level, any percentage of poverty, knows that there are those children who are right below that eligibility level, who won't qualify for whether it's free and reduced or whatever the program is. And so they struggle, they suffer. Now, Ms. Scott and I both come, and, and Ms. Mack is from District 1, 1, 4, and 2. It is not just about poverty level. We're also talking about poverty levels matched with uh, those children who are our black and brown children. And their parents very often, because of all sorts of social, political, economic um, history and um, degradation, will struggle before they will fill out those forms. That's the truth. And we see that happening in those schools all the time. The beauty in CEP is that if there are enough children who are qualifying, then all of the children are going to be embraced and taken care of. So. I'm not sure, just, and I looked up all the information about SAT and AP and what they don't get a waiver for. If you're hungry, you're waving for a meal. You're not WAIB waving, trying to sit down and take a test while your stomach is growling. And it happens not to be so anyway, because there are different levels on which children will qualify. So we might have to do something that is a little different if we embrace CEP, but our children are worth it. They are worth it. And if we're able to feed more children, then we have hit the mother load. So I embrace that motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. And I have Ms. Scott uh, who, um, Yes, spoke once, right, thank and then, you. And then Mr. Uh, Muhamza. So if we can, uh, you know, be more concise, we are quite behind with still quite a, a bit of work to do. So thank you. Certainly, and I'm I'm always concise. So thank you for that. Um, what I would just like to know is basically, based on the motion, if we um, um, with with Dr. with what Dr. Hager said. Would it be um, expanding CEP to all eligible schools or just those, would it be continuing just those in the pilot program? That's my first question. I guess no, sort of yes or no. All, el all eligible school, all schools eligible as of June 30th, 2020, which would be the maximum number given that poverty rates have gone up so much. Okay, so that's one. Number two, um, what would we, if anything, because the school, system allowed the pilot program to, I guess, end. 
and I guess I would just be curious, if we reinstate the CEP program, what would we be missing out on? Is there something else, like like I think Ms. Pastor had said to uh, SAT programs or other things, are there other things that we would be missing out on? It could, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand it, CEP is free meals for all students as opposed to Title I, which is free meals for students that are eligible. However, there are other benefits to the school and to the system and in and, um, and regards to other things. So I, I, I guess I would just like to know, we make this eligible for all other schools, but is there anything that we would be missing out on as, um, by doing so? Thank you. Is that for me or for the county? So oh, it's I, for staff. So I, Miss uh, Scott, this is Dr. McComas again, and I'm happy to share um, and try to uh, um, answer your question. So um, it's twofold. So and just to to reiterate, um, it's not Title One that pays for the food for free and reduced and um, uh, reduced price. Uh, students. It's the Baltimore County Cares for Kids program and the Maryland Cares for Kids program. For, so students in those two categories are paid for under the Baltimore County and Maryland Cares for Kids Act. Uh, and so those students do have meals. And I just wanted to clarify from Ms. Pasteur as well that uh, those students would have access to meals under those other programs. The difference is the, the paid students having access or not. And of course, as we said, those students may technically be in the paid category, but are just barely in that threshold um, who could also use the support. Um, in terms of other benefits that are trade-offs, um, there are many fees and waivers that um, families that self-report using the farms forms that qualifies them for waivers for lots of other things. So for example, students that are in dual enrollment, it helps um, waive their fees for textbooks um, and some of the additional service fees that are charged. Uh, it waives fees for AP exams. Um, and so there is an ancillary uh, benefits to the self-reporting form. And as Dr. Hager um, and Ms. Stansberry spoke to, one of the key differences is under CEP, we do not, in fact, we're not allowed to ask families to self-report. We can only base the rates on those, um, uh, the data that is provided to us from other agencies as Ms. Stansberry described and as Dr. Uh, Hager described. Um, we eliminate the parent self-reporting. Um, and so that eliminates a certain number of families that we otherwise would not hear from. Um, and so that's also one of the trade-offs um, of that. And so, yes, you're right. If I am a student who is eligible um, and I don't self-report, I, I certainly could be getting my meals through either the Cares for Kids uh, programs or through CEP. But if I don't have a self-reporting um, farms form, it makes it more complicated. There's more work then for me to try to pursue waivers in other areas, like waivers for college applications as well. So just to give you an example uh, to try to answer your question. So that is a good answer because then what that does is that means it's somewhat concerning then to me then. So if I'm a student and I'm at a school where it's CEP, then I may be getting free meals, but then I may not get a waiver when I apply to college or for AP exams or, or some of the other things that you mentioned. So how would we then um, accommodate those students? It, that's not not 100% accurate. So there, a lot of times in a CEP school, a lot of those waivers are eligible for all students. And, and there are other eligibility criteria. And this program has been around since 2014. And so there were some very early concerns that, that are, we're hearing a lot of tonight. But a lot of those concerns have been basically done away with over time because we figured out other ways to ensure that these kids are getting all of those services, which is why I was really concerned about that slide 17. And if the county itself decides to use the farms rate as the way to distribute Title I funds, then that's the county's decision. And if we go to full CEP so that all the eligible, eligible schools are participating, then we can choose to use the ISP, so the, the, the direct certification is what they're calling it, to make that the metric of how we distribute our Title I funds instead of using the farms rate. And that's up to us to decide. It's not, um, it's, that's not a national decision. So, I, I don't, I just worry that there's some kind of misunderstanding of some of the information around CEP. So Dr. McComas, how would we then take care of that? How would we, how would we accommodate that and make sure that those students are not 
um, misunderstood or, 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 or maligned or caught anything? How would we make sure that we are adequately supporting those students so they, they don't fall through the cracks? Well, this is Melissa with said, I mean, if every school was CEP, like the 66 schools, as it shows on this slide, were CEP and we were using a different model, that, as Dr. Hager was saying before, because we only did four schools, four schools had direct cert as the way every other school was using free and reduced meal forms as the way. We'd have to look at a completely different way of doing all of the schools it, because of the discrepancy is where we're having an issue. Okay. But because that data is provided, then it should be straightforward. The ISP rate for all schools is provided. So there are other ways. Okay. To yeah. I, I, just a, another concern because our um, English learner population continues to rise as well we see that um, many of those families are not qualifying for those government assistance. So we know the numbers drop as direct cert in those schools that have high populations of that. So ju that's just another layer. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next, we have Mr. Muhamza and then we have Ms. Hen. Yes. yes. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, I understand the staff's um, hesitation with these uh, this program, but I'm going to agree with uh, Dr. Hager. Um, I'd like to see data that shows how uh, implementing the whole program to all eligible schools uh, will result. Um, I go to Dundalk, and I, I can speak anecdotally to the impacts of the uh, program. What, you, uh, what Dr. Hager uh, added, um, uh, correctly uh, pointed out too was that the la the lack of stigma uh, if this program is implemented. Um, my school we don't um, discriminate on who can afford lunch or not because everybody has the same amount of gets the same uh, lunch. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons I want to support this um, program and Dr. Bigger's motion. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with, with the comments and I also um, support this motion. The board has previously taken the position of supporting CEP and for whatever reasons, um, the expansion did not happen and we can no longer wait. Um, now is the time we need to move this forward. So that being said, I move the previous question. Second, Josh Mahomes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Uh, Ms. Gover, this requires a two-third vote. Um, can I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Ms. Custer? Absolutely. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Crosby? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Roth? Yes. Thank you. The vote's unanimous to move the question, and so now we will vote on Dr. Hager's uh, motion. Would you like to restate that just quickly? Sure. Um, I move that BCBS fully implement CEP and all schools eligible for CEP as of June 30th, 2020 meeting the August 31st, 2020 CEP filing deadline. Ms. Gover, can I have the roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Max? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Ruff? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously, and we appreciate uh, Dr. Williams' and staff uh, and everyone for that discussion. The next item on the agenda is new business contract awards, and for that I call on Building and Contracts Committee Chair 
Julie Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one moment. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items P1 through P7 and items P9 through P16 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Item P8 is being forwarded without a recommendation. Board members, do I have a motion to approve items P1 through P7 and P9 through P16? Offerman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Chun? Yes. Ms. Tester? I was absent, so I abstain. I guess. <laughs> this was uh, during building and contracts, so you weren't. Um, oh, you need to I wasn't to even invited. Okay, so I don't know. Okay. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That, that motion carries. Uh, so, Ms. Hen, now you um, have to address P8. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I believe the committee had wanted to discuss P8 further and we had um, run out of time in committee. So if staff are still available um, to answer questions regarding P8 and present that to the full board. Yes, ma'am. Just ahead. for the public and for the uh, all the board members, can you um, please address the number of the contract and also the uh, contents just yes. briefly? Thank you. JME 503-20 automatic school bus stop arm and bus safety video monitoring system. And I believe I heard Dr. Scriven. Uh, yes, ma'am. Staff's available to answer any and all questions at this time. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Rowe, did you have questions you wanted to yes. raise from committee? Okay. Yes, I do. Is now the appropriate time? Yes. Please continue. Okay. So I have read the Montgomery County IG report concerning this vendor, and their experience is very concerning. And the report states, uh, quote, in 2018, the CEO of FMS, a non-FMS business associate, the Dallas County School Superintendent, and the Mayor Pro Tem of Dallas all pleaded guilty to crimes involving bribes and kickbacks paid to public officials in Dallas in exchange for favorable actions furthering FMS local business interests. These interests mainly involve the implementation and operation of a school bus stoplight camera enforcement program. Mr. Leonard was sentenced in May of 2019 to serve seven years in prison for what federal prosecutors describe as the largest domestic public corruption case in history. And this is on page two of that IG report. Additionally, it states, based on comments made during testimony before the Council Education Committee on September 27, 2018, it appears that even after significant adverse information came to light, Montgomery County government and Montgomery County Public Schools may have continued to rely on information provided by the vendor. A Montgomery County Police Department employee commented during the Education Committee work session that the United States Department of Justice was, quote, aware and even blessed the takeover of bus patrol by FMS. 
OIG staff contacted the assigned prosecuting assistant United States attorney for the Northern District of Texas to ask whether the activities of bus patrol were blessed by the DOJ. In response, the prosecuting attorney wrote, quote, we were aware but haven't blessed anything. A statement that the DOJ had somehow blessed or approved the assimilation of FMS into bus patrol would likely have been relied on by the Education Committee to alleviate concerns regarding continued MCG involvement with this contract and bus patrol slash FMS. The fact that this vendor supplied statement appears to be incorrect should be explored further, and that's page nine. Additionally, it states, quote, responding to our concern about this statement, Montgomery County Public Schools provided a letter on Canadian law firm letterhead signed by a Canadian attorney on August 21st, 2017, that allegedly verifies, contrary to the statement of the CEO of Bus Patrol, the bus patrol did purchase the contracts of FMS. That attorney is listed in Canadian legal documents as a co-director of Bus Patrol Canada with the CEO of Bus Patrol. This letter appears to be designed to give the impression that it is from independent legal counsel when it is nothing more than a self-serving verification from Bus Patrol. The business relationship between the attorney and the CEO of Bus Patrol as co-directors of Bus Patrol Canada was not disclosed in the letter. Although we did not evaluate whether the statement in the letter was legally correct, we remain concerned about the lack of disclosure. While Bus Patrol and FMS may technically be different corporate entities, they remain at the same address with the same telephone number and using the same equipment on the same contracts. The president of FMS is now the president of Bus Patrol and is the same person who introduced a criminal conspirator to county and Montgomery County Public School employees. Furthermore, it was also discovered that the current CEO of Bus Patrol is listed in Canadian legal documents as being a co-director of Force Multiplier Solutions Canada, which filed a corporate name change to become Bus Patrol Canada. It is not apparent that any significant due diligence process took place concerning information supplied by the vendor even after significant adverse information came to light. However, both Montgomery County Police Department and Montgomery County Public Schools appear to remain reluctant to reassess the MOU or the contract and continue to rely on vendor-supplied information to justify the business case and public safety value of the program. Given the continuity of key people, history of corporate name changes, and the pattern of misinformation provided a prudent response of healthy skepticism appears appropriate before transferring millions of dollars from the drivers of Montgomery County to this company. As a result, we regard the contract and MOU as needing careful review by the Montgomery County Public Schools and the county attorney, and that was page 10. When the board first asked questions about this, we were given similar information that Bus Patrol and FMS were not the same company. While in name only, that appears to be correct, this very credible independent report by the Montgomery County IG office suggests this is untrue. It appears based on the Montgomery County IG report that this board is being asked to give taxpayer funds to a vendor that has admitted to bribing public officials resulting in incarceration and subsequent name change of the vendor. No information has been provided which negates the M Montgomery County IG report nor vindicates the vendor. Therefore, while I support the bus arm camera concept, I will not support any contract with this particular vendor. Dr. Graham, would you like to respond? Yes, hi, good evening, uh, members of the board, and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this uh, very important safety initiative. So I'll keep um, my comments or response to this brief, but if there are further questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, it is true that Bus Patrol did buy certain intellectual property and assets from Force Multiplier in a highly competitive bid process. It did not buy stock or assume any liabilities from Force Multiplier, however. Bus Patrol's board of managers and its officers, including the CEO, never had any ownership interest nor management control over Force Multiplier. So much of the contract that was noted in that IG's report um, and some of the concerns that came out of it about the funding that the county put out was from a contract that was in 2016. 
Um, I do believe the board was provided a, a letter again from the Montgomery County School Systems in January of 2020 when they have decided to again renegotiate and enter into another MOU um, with bus patrol. Um, since that time, I also would like to point out that the boards of Carroll County, Howard County, and Prince George's County have also entered into agreements with bus patrol regarding their stop arm enforcement program. Thank you. Other board members? Hi, this is Russ Kuhn. I have a question. <clears throat> I understand that the way this company operates is they come in, they install all of the, um, they install their product on all of our buses, and then they sit there and they generate tickets and collect the fees associated with those tickets. <clears throat> and they pay themselves back. And <clears throat> some, at some point, there is a fee sharing um, agreement. So my question is, what is the fee sharing structure and agreement associated with this contract for Baltimore County? So thank you for that question, Mr. Kuhn. And, and actually, that is, that's actually um, one of the issues in that first iteration of the Montgomery County contract that was a gap, that was a definite problem. And so I'm gonna ask Mr. Kenny West, who's the assistant director to um, answer this question more fully, but in our version of the contract or the contract that we um, will be proposing or entering in if the board does approve um, this particular contract uh, for us, um, that revenue sharing would start from the beginning. Um, and basically one of the problems or the gaps in the Montgomery contract that was noted in the IG report is that the school system and was, was actually on the hook for several hundred thousand dollars to help the enforcement of this program. Again, since that time, um, bus patrol and municipalities have learned from that contract. And so that revenue sharing will start from the very beginning. And Mr. West, if you'd like to chime in on that, that would be helpful. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Graham, you are exactly correct. Um, that was one of the gaps in the initial execution of the contract between Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery County Government, and Force Multiplier Solutions, that the initial outlay of cost from Force Multiplier Solutions was uh, completely recovered before there was any revenue sharing. In subsequent contracts and after bus um, of course, multiple solutions was no longer bus patrol um, assumed that uh, contract with Montgomery County Public Schools. The language is very different. So the cost of all the equipment is essentially amortized throughout the life of the contract. And therefore, that revenue sharing does take place um, initially. There is there's two components of that. The first are the fees that are recovered by the by the company and that pays for all the camera equipment, the connectivity and so forth. And also there is a set fee that is sent directly to the Baltimore County Police Department and that is for the cost that the chief will assume by having the police officers who are the final uh, staff members to approve or reject the citations before they become true legitimate citations. After that point, then the uh, revenue share is issued. But again, that starts at the beginning. It does not wait until after the, the, the cost of the program has been uh, recovered by the company. Thank you for that answer. Um, just a follow on. I don't see anything in what has been provided to us that outlays or even gives us projections of what is expected to be spent and recovered. I just see a zero cost. So, Zach, do you have that information? And I guess I'm concerned that it hasn't been provided for us to review. 
So thank you for that question, Mr. Kuhn. And um, Mr., uh, Mr., as Mr. Saris and I were, were discussing with the contracts committee earlier, you'll see that next to this contract, it is, it is of zero cost to the board. So if we, we were to need any funding for this, we would have to actually come back to the board and request funding for it. It is a zero dollar contract, which means that, it, that, that all of the equipment, as Mr. West said, is paid out through that um, that revenue generation. Um, that's not not so much by taxpayer money as was indicated or, or mentioned earlier, but actually by any violators. So it's not a, your average taxpayer. It's only folks that that violate this county ordinance that would need to pay the fine associated with it. Um, so the the really the only cost to us would be um, the the redirected uh, resources of some of my staff. Um, this this program would actually save us um, some time and, and effort in some ways because um, at present we install all of our own cameras on our buses. Um, Bus Patrol would do that moving moving into the future, and also our ability to retrieve um, video from inside of our school buses when the, when there are issues. Um, we would be able to handle that much more efficiently. Right now, that's a very laborious process that requires the actual physical removal of a hard drive from a bus. Um, with this new system, we would actually be able to do that uh, remotely and uh, much more efficiently. So that's why you see no cost and, and no outline to that. The, um, the, the projected revenue generation from citations um, would be somewhere around $11 million uh, per year is, is what is being estimated at this time. And again, through the, the contract details, there would be a revenue share between the Baltimore County government and, um, and bus patrol to, to recoup their um, you know, initial layout of all of the, the equipment and then for the technology. So thank you for that answer. I just have one one, one final comment, and then I'll yield. Um, this, this system um, is an interesting uh, solution to a problem. But part of my concern is this is an after action type of item. It is a recording of someone doing something unsafe that perhaps puts our, our children at risk. So I see it as a reactive type of a solution. And my concern, and one of the things that I would suggest that we look at in the near future is to come up with a proactive way to actually stop people in the moment. And I've seen this, and I'm, I'm concerned that this hasn't come before us because there are actually arms that are four to six feet wide that pop out from the side of a bus that will physically stop you from driving by. And I would suggest that we look at that in the future to be proactive to keep some child from getting hit by a car rather than reactive and finding people after the fact. Thank you. And Mr. Kuhn, thank you for thank you for that because this initiative is is absolutely focused on student safety. Um, and so that is that is the cornerstone, the bedrock of what we want to do here. And actually, if you look at, at the data, and at, we keep referring back to Montgomery County because they've Jesus. had this program now for five years. Um, but in, in looking at that district, um, only about 10 percent of their um, of their offenders are repeat offenders, which demonstrates that um, oftentimes if someone is cited for this, and again, that, that is still a reactive approach, but there is an educational component and there's public service announcements um, that will be a part of this program between my office and the Baltimore County government, um, including the police department, to put this out there because it is about our students' safety first. So thank you again. Thank you. And then, uh Dr. Hager, did you have your hand up? Um, it was uh, just a clarification question. Um, if schools are delayed and starting for a semester, would the contract go into effect when we actually start using our buses again, or will we be essentially in the hole for all the time that the buses weren't running that first semester of school? Dr. Hager, I can answer that question for you, and thank you. Um, the contract actually will be worded that the the technology fees will only begin 
on the first of the month of in which the first citation is issued. So if buses don't actually go um, start running until uh, October or November or whatever the decision is, um, the program would effectively start at the beginning of the month in which the first citation is issued. So um, although they may be outfitted, um, the program will not effectively begin until that month. Thank you. And, doc and Dr. Hager, I'd only like to add, it will take us um, some time to obviously uh, to, to initiate the contract with the vendor um, and then the installation of, of these devices and the training for our staff um, would take some time. So we are looking at a, at a several month implementation for that. Thank you. This is um, Mrs. Causey and then we have Ms. Mack with a question and a comment and I also have a comment. Ms. Mack. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to go. Um, I have one, actually, a, a question. Um, I don't, I'm just re repeating a question that I asked um, when we discussed this in building in contracts for the um, for people who are listening. I know that you, Mr. Saris, Mr. Grimm, Mr. West, and Dr. Scriven, you have all said that this contract will have zero dollar impact on. Um, BCPS's budget, whether it and I, it's, it would be operating budget. So I just wanted to ask that question again, since we're in op, you know open session in the full board meeting. Can you tell me again that this contract, if passed, will have no I, no impact on BCPS's budget at any time in the future, other than the impact, Mr. Grimm, you talked about. Um, for your staff or something? So I will take that as key for this division uh, that to the best of my knowledge, no, there would be no impact. There is the piece that Dr. Grimm brought up about if there was any financial impact, uh, we would have to come back to the board. As this contract is set up right now, there is zero cost to Baltimore County Public Schools. But my concern, Dr. Scriven, is in the past, and I've only been on the board for 18 months, this type of thing has happened, and the words that are said to the board many months or even years down the road are, we, you know, we can't get out of this. We have to pay this money. And I know that one of the systems discussed in the study, I think it was Dallas, um, ended up getting hit with a multi-million dollar um, payout because the, the the process did not create enough revenue to pay the company for their upfront cost. And that is what I'm afraid of. And I heard somebody just in answer to Dr. Hager's question mention technology fees, and I, I don't even know what they are and where they play into this. So, so George, Saris, if you're on the line, uh, based on your knowledge, can you add any insight uh, to Ms. Mack's concerns? Well, other than that I will personally not issue any checks to this company because, uh, and I'm going for, for my part, and I completely trust the law office to do the same as well as our purchasing manager in editing the final contract, ensure that, that, that there is no such uh, circumstance by which we would issue any uh, payments to this vendor. It's, uh, it's not gonna leave my office. I can just tell you that and give you that assurance and we'll do everything we can to make sure that all the documentation uh, supports that. And we're not getting any of the revenue. So I'm certainly not too excited about paying for any expenses. And Ms. Mack, if I can add, you, you are correct about the, um, about the, the payout that other districts have had to engage in with, uh, with force multiplier. And that was a result of bad contracts. Um, I'll say that very plainly. That was a result of 
um, of prior contracts. And as I as I believe I've indicated, um, municipalities uh, such as Howard Jesus, County, Jesus. Prince George's County, Carroll County, and hopefully Baltimore County, we've learned from that. In, in Montgomery County's latest iteration of the contract, um, we, we've learned that, that we can't enter into a contract that way because to your point, um, we don't have that those kinds of funds laying around. However, this is a great solution um, uh, for safety for our students and a way for, for us and, and the vendor to be able to partner in um, providing a solution for, um, again, the safety of our students. Thank you. So this is Ms. Causey, and um, I had uh, comments. Since my time on the board in the last uh, five years, there have been instances where we have uh, engaged in cooperative contracts and um, in other MOUs, and there have been some um, adverse effects to that. I certainly, as much as anyone, want to keep every student safe in and on and around uh, our buses. Uh, there was a great discussion, a, a lengthy discussion at the county council around that. Uh, what doesn't make sense to me is that they're installing, I believe it's 11 million in equipment and at the fine of $250 um, a fee, it would be thousands of citations necessary to recoup those costs. Um, and the point of the equipment is to have the instances go down. So then how are you going to have the citations? But the other issue is that we have in front of us re-entry, launching the strategic plan, trying to feed our children. And in terms of staff time and resources um, and logistics, uh, there's just so many things that we need to do for our children and our staff and our community. So I have concerns around this, and I will I will not be supporting it. Um, as Mr. Kuhn pointed out, there's other technologies, and uh, even in terms of uh, perhaps finding a a, um, a better um, bid or a contract for it. So um, I see one other hand up. That's uh, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also will not be supporting this contract. And as another board member stated, I, I don't have a problem with this program and I certainly support all safety measures for our students. But, and, but as two members of the county council mentioned when they discussed the legislation um, creating this program, they, they asked what problem we are trying to solve and they questioned the urgency around it um, given the nature of, of the safety concerns and and they, they question the need for it and so so that's one hand my my concern is with this vendor in particular and we had a good discussion in committee um around the fact that this vendor is um the lead and, and really the only player it sounds like in the market and i don't think that's a good thing and competition is a good thing for the school system it lowers um, costs it drives quality and it it enforces integrity and ethical business practices and i don't think we can say that um without with all certainty that that that's the case here based on the history which ms Rowe outlined and which is documented in the montgomery county inspector general report there are too many red flags and too many concerns with this particular vendor that I, I also can't support this. So I think had had there been other um, vendors in, in the market that were considered, it sounds like there are not, that this is a program that I'd be interested in learning more about, learning what other vendors have to offer. That doesn't seem to be the case here. And there are too many um, red flags with this particular vendor that um, I won't be supporting this contract for that reason. For that reason. Thank you. With that, with that being said, is there a motion regarding uh, contract P item P eight? I'll make a motion. Uh, Mr. McMillian. 
I move that we accept the contract. Is there a second? Okay, the contract fails for lack of a second. Um, thank you, Dr. Scriven and team. We are now moving to the next item on the agenda, which is item Q, new business special project request, Franklin Elementary School. And for that, we call forward Ms. Byers, community superintendent. Hi, good evening, Chair Kazi, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, members of the board. Tonight, I'm bringing forward for approval privately funded capital improvement project to purchase and install new audiovisual equipment in the gymnasium at Franklin Elementary School. Uh, this project is being funded by a donation uh, from the Franklin Elementary PTA. The Franklin Elementary PTA has provided $10,898 to purchase and install the new equipment, and they plan to cover any cost overruns. The cost of the equipment and the installation uh, are both reflected in a quote from CTSI in the amount of $10,898, and that quote is in your packet. In accordance with policy and rules 7330, this request has progressed through all the normal internal processes of review. That's all. Excuse me, needed to unmute. Do I have a motion to approve the special project for new audiovisual equipment in the gymnasium at Franklin Elementary School? So moved, Mac. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Second Offerman. Offerman. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the uh, agenda is item R, unfinished business board policies. For that, uh, members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 1270, parent and family engagement, policy 3111, budget planning and preparation, Policy 4003, Recruitment and Selection. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit R. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Mahumza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, the next item is item S, board member comments. And I would ask board members if we, uh, I make a motion that we postpone that to the next meeting. Is there a second? Second. 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 Uh, <laughs> may I have a vote? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you restate that? I missed that. I'm making a motion to move item S, board member comments, to the next meeting. Okay. Madam Chair, it's item T. Excuse me? Item T, board member comments. Oh, did it get moved? Ms. Causey, do we need a vote? Because you've already moved one of the other agenda items without one. So 
if we have a consensus of the board, we'll put it on for August 11th. That sounds, yes, we do. Okay, so board member comments is moved to the next meeting. Uh, the next item is information. There's a number of items attached to board docs, financial report, fiscal year 2022 operating and capital budget schedules, policy schedule for review in the upcoming year, policy review committee, policy editing conventions, and also questions and answers on appeals and hearings handbook that was recently revised. The last item on our agenda tonight is item U, announcements. Our next board meeting is currently scheduled Tuesday, August 11th, 2020 at 630. And I want to thank all the staff and community. There were a lot of folks with us tonight. We appreciate it. We appreciate your input. Everyone take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>